From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I'm your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for tuning us in tonight on our terrestrial affiliates across North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Now, if you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Here we go again with another edition of Ghosts of the Great White North as my favorite paranormal investigator, Merle, is back from a paranormal round trip. Yeah, I guess I wrote that. Paranormal round trip to a haunted location here in British Columbia. Tonight, we take a look at Canada's most western province and the hauntings that surround it. Our special guests are from the website hauntedhistorybc.com as sisters Gina and Victoria... Join us to tell us about a collection of stories they've recorded and encountered with strange phenomena. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire, brought to you by Paranoia Magazine, which will be a lot of fun as well. Let's kick things off here. Merle, how you doing, buddy? Doing great, Dave. Very tired. I did uh, five haunted locations in five days. Oh, I don't man. think I've slept that- yet. Well, you're acting like you're dead right now, so I guess you're a ghost here tonight. <laughs> no pun intended, right? Oh, no, total pun intended, man. Total pun intended. How was your trip? It was good. We started off in Sandon, B.C., um, did a night there, then we went to Cody, B.C. Um, so those towns were during the Silver Rush in uh, the BC in B.C. history. Then we went into the Rockies, where I'm not allowed to say the name of the place, but we did an old hotel from 1860, sorry, 1892, um, in and around the Sycamus, B.C. area. And we also, well, here we hit that for two nights, and then we also did a bunch of old train cars from the 1800s. It's really nice. I got to ask about the train. I got to ask about the train cars, man, because I could just imagine what that's like doing that. I haven't done that yet. What's that like going on something that was literally helping ship everything across the country? It was wicked, but but the more cool part of it was is we were doing the old-fashioned passenger train cars that were all in original condition. Some were refurbished, some weren't. So the history you feel going into these, the, the energy, um, one of the train cars just... Well, I'm thinking about it now. We experienced uh, people walking up and down the the hallway, and it was not us because we were sitting on one of the beds doing a rolling an EVP session. Very active. Oh, nice! Very nice. You get some good uh, audio, get some good feedback and video. Did you did you get beat up? Because normally you get beat up on location. No, no beating up. I was uh, I played nice. They played nice. Um, a lot of visual evidence this time. I don't think I've seen so much visual evidence in quite some time in one spot um, to the point where we'd ask for responses and we'd see wheels turning of vehicles because some of the vehicles were kind of up on blocks that were on display. Oh, and that's um, freaky. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, it would it, would, it literally looked like somebody grabbed the wheel and spun it right in front of our eyes. I didn't even know what to, I didn't, still speechless thinking about it. That is kind of cool. That is kind of cool. Let's bring in our guests tonight, Victoria and Gina. These are a pair of sisters from the lower mainland of British Columbia. They're not part of any paranormal team, but they have a really, really cool website called, I believe it's hauntedhistorybc.com. And, you know, all they've done is the research that a lot of people haven't done. And I think that's absolutely great. This is their first time uh, doing the whole radio thing. So, ladies, welcome so much to Spaced Out Radio for the first time. Gina, thank you for joining us. Hey, Dave, can you hear us now? Yeah, Yeah, we can hear you. Everybody, just wanted to say hello and so thrilled that you're having us on tonight. We greatly appreciate it so we can share our passion and what we love to do. Um, Like you said, we're relatively new to the whole thing. Um, We just launched 
our website back in May, as well as our Twitter account. So, um, yeah, we had no idea how it would take, you know, how it would take off. And so uh, it's great that we're getting a response. It's great that tonight we'll get to share um, a little bit of what we do and um, how we got interested in ghosts. All right, Victoria. Uh, mm-hmm. This has got to be a lot of fun for you working with your sister on this on this hobby that's turned into a project that's now kind of starting to blow up. It really certainly does. Actually, I have to say um, we, we didn't even think we would do anything like this. And um, it was kind of exciting. We were thinking about this around maybe November, December. We we're trying to figure out ways of how to uh, put together some of the information and the things that we've gathered Uh, We used to go for trips sometimes, and we would collect all these photographs and just uh, research certain areas. And uh, somehow we decided, sure, why not? Why don't we try to do something about it? Maybe publish a book, maybe publish something, um, get some photos in somewhere. And then we figured, why not, like, do some, you know, do a website, maybe figure out, do, like, a wall calendar, just something like that. So we, we came up with a lot of great ideas. And it just flowed from there. We just kept getting more great ideas, and we just started. We just took off. So yeah, it's yeah. And when we looked at, um, you know, if there was anything haunted as far as calendars out there or anything, just I know that mostly everybody keeps stuff on their phones and whatever. But there wasn't really anything historical, and there wasn't anything really, you know, with good haunted stories or exactly. write-ups. You know, there's a lot of picture type calendars. But we actually put, you know, took the time to put like an introduction. We uh, focused on Victoria this time because that's the place not where we me. went. Uh, not yeah, me, not, not my city. sister. <laughs> um, the actual location. Um, but uh, we went, you know, did a lot of trips. Um, little did we know at the time when we were taking pictures that we would actually be publishing them. So we're very lucky that we got yeah. some really, really good photos that we wanted to share. So, you know, we, it was hard to kind of pick which locations. And that's why we did a 16-month um, sixteen month calendar when we came out with it. But exactly. And just a little bit of background of how we got into um, ghosts and the paranormal. So that all started, with, like with many people, we've read a lot of books and everybody who seems to be in the paranormal seems to be really, um, seems to have started when they were kids. Like there was something that drew them to reading about mm-hmm. ghosts. Um, they usually had an early on experience, which I had a couple of experiences. So um, that was really interesting. And then... Um, even just as a kid, like, I don't know if everybody knows, but Alfred Hitchcock actually put out like kids books to do with ghosts and hauntings. And, you know, so we kind of read all of those and we read like two true to life hauntings. I remember reading um, back in the day, you know, the tower of London and the ghost of Anne Boleyn and all that. So it kind of really intrigued me. And I was probably like nine or 10 years old at the time. So it was very, you know, exciting. It scared you, you know, but you still kind of were, were drawn to it. And then I would have to say that um, when we were about 10 or 11, we started doing like crazy little seances in like our friends' basements and our basement. (laughs) So that was something that, you know, we liked freaking people out and we liked to be freaked out. We liked freaking people out. So it was something that started kind of early on when we were quite young. And then so it just kind of continued on for a while. And um, I remember one of my earliest experiences was just kind of when we were in our very first house and it was just uh, me, my sister, my parents and the rooms kind of faced each other so that the doors kind of, if they were open, you could see into each other's room. So I remember one night waking up and kind of looking up into the corner and you hear the story a lot with people. You see the light in the corner hovering, you know, it's not a reflection you know it's not, you, know, you try to, even at that stage, you always try to figure out what it is. And there was this odd light, it was kind of a yellowish green, hovered, and then probably stuck around, I would say, for like a good 10 minutes. And you try to figure it out and went away. And then the second time I remember, probably like a year later, having an experience where I woke up and like the room was filled with sort of like little tiny lights that would sort of gather and in my mind I thought am I dreaming this I see like almost like little staticky type lights and they're kind of in this ball and I kind of tried to pinch myself because you're supposed to pinch yourself you're not you know dreaming and all that but I in my mind I was telling them to like create little create little shapes like a butterfly a flower and they were like in the middle of the room and this probably went on for like 20 minutes so I don't know to this day what that was um 
just eventually disappeared, never saw it again, and don't have a clue how to explain it. So one of those strange things that you never forget. And for quite some time after that, we didn't really revisit uh, any ghostly activity together. I mean, we always kind of liked it in the past, but then, um, then how the whole thing started is we thought, you know, we'll do this calendar. It was just kind of a natural thing. Like, Hey, let's do a haunted calendar. And then we started our website and the main goal with starting the website was just, um, not just wanting to share haunted things, but just also the history part. So for us, a huge part, like when you go on the website, you'll see a lot of like historical content. Like, so we talk about when the buildings were built and then um, look at why sites are active. Maybe um, that's a good, I think that's right. a good start. You kind of need to know where the building, you know, where it originated, who lived in there, what's the potential for the activity. And then um, who inhabited the land, for example. I know that's true. And um, we also like look at things like even we go through and look at even the geography of the area just to, you know, consider that as well. A lot of times people say too that like certain spiritual energies are more attracted to like the foundation or the bedrock too, like granite, limestone or quartz. So we look at that. We look at as well as the age and the history. And obviously there's sometimes a lot of uh, connections to the First Nations culture as well in that area. So, you know, you have to just kind of look at that, too, like the type of people who lived there and died in those areas. And um, you never know, like sometimes the spiritual environment there, that just attracts just more, more energy over there. Um, and we also consider also the possibility of, of ley lines as well. I mean, there, there is a belief, too, that's out there that, you know, there are straight lines that could be drawn between various historic structures and prominent landmarks. So you never know. So we, we take into consideration everything. Yeah, and it's not just simply that you're hunting for ghosts or paranormal activity all the time. So you're doing lots of research in the meantime. And um, I think just to be able to figure out, you know, what's going on, you need to do your research and you need to kind of do it right. And, you know, we want to be as authentic as possible when we're sharing all this information because a lot of times, you know, to us it's new information. And then, you know, with our readers or people on the website or following us on right. social media, like you want to be, you know, as accurate as you can. Right. Yeah. That's correct. I, I want to I want to ask you, ladies, because your your website hauntedhistorybc.com tells the tales of a number of stories and a number of locations, you know. And you know, I like your mission statement: researching paranormal activity, legends of hauntings, and local fo folklore while preserving Canada's past and present history. This is something that a lot of Canadians are not good at. And that is learning about the history. We seem to be very focused on today, especially, it doesn't matter what generation it is, whether it's the older generation or the younger generations. Canada really hasn't ever been a country that embraces its history, whether that's cemeteries, whether that's old buildings, whether that's, uh, you know, we always want to tear down something old and put something fresh and new up. I don't know why, you know but that's just that's the, exactly the way it is. I was saying today too because just as a sideline I'll tell everybody that I actually also refurbish um, antique art deco jewelry like in my spare time so I find it on eBay it's you know the good stuff usually like the platinum gold stuff and you know people want to melt it down or whatever but I take the time to refurbish it if I can't do it myself I get a really good jeweler to do it and so that's the same feeling I have is like when there's old stuff you can't everybody wants to just you know destroy everything, tear it down. And I think just it comes from a lack of knowing like the importance of certain structures or landmarks or heritage sites. I think if we take the time to know about them, we might be less likely to want to take that route. And I don't know if everybody, you know, on Twitter, I know that um, the old Hastings Mill Museum and Store um, recently was in that boat where, um, they, because of the pandemic, they didn't have the funding and whatever. So they were looking at um, closing down and possibly, you know, getting taken over by a land developer and, you know, something like that. I mean, once it's gone, it's really gone forever. So it really bothers me that people go that route. Um, I was just very happy when they reached their GoFundMe and they're, you know, going to be around. I mean, this is one of the oldest buildings in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an English Bay. Um, it wasn't, is it's not just a, you know, store back in the day. I mean, you know, when you read about it, you find out that, you know, it was a center for people getting their news. So they would come to the right. store, they would buy their goods, they would, you know, find their, you know, get their news updates every week. They would gather there for social services and 
all kinds of things. So it's, you know, not just a building that is a meaningless building. So I was really, really thrilled when uh, they reached their goal and looks like they're going to be able to operate again. So that's one of the right. things that we are focused on. I mean, if there's haunted activity, that's really great. But there's also the historical point that we think is really, really right. important. Also, and yeah, Merle, I, I want to bring Merle in here for a quick second because Merle, oh, yeah. you just did a five day tour of haunted locations and and looking into that history. Do you notice mm-hmm. Merle around British Columbia because you're in BC as well? All of us are. Okay. Do you notice that you know outside of what we call the Lower Mainland of British Columbia, which is the Van- Greater Vancouver area, that it's when you get into the small towns and you get into the maybe some of those those not not really middle of the range cities but just those those local villages and, and small towns that are that that are traipsed across the British Columbia mountains that they are the ones that are really trying to preserve that type of history and that type of folklore and they are actually embracing the weird and strange that goes on Merle oh hundred percent this is a total different mentality up there. Like when we were up in Sandin, we found this little town called New Denver. And we're like, what's in New Denver? So we're looking around and we stumble across a preserved Japanese internment camp. Oh. So so like we go do a tour of that and all the history you learn there. And then we are talking to the curator at that place. And she's like, oh, you should drive 10 minutes down to Silverton, B.C. And we're like, what's in Silverton, B.C.? And it's all preserved history of the railroad, of the internment camps of all the logging, the mining, everything. And it's untouched. Nobody nobody goes there. It's too far. Eight and a half hours is a long drive for a lot of people. But yeah, there's so much history in this province alone that it would blow your mind if you really dug. Like, I've done a lot of time and a lot of investigations in the lower mainland of British Columbia. And that's why we tend to try and stay out. Like, we go up around Dave's area. We'll go, now we've been going east. Because it's all untouched. It's all unspoiled, meaning like there's not a ton of energies in there or other types of ghost hunters going in and trying to raise the dead, if you know what I mean. It's all nice. And the locals there, they just chat your ear off with all the old stories, all of the old folklore. Um, like our team, just like you guys, we're, we're history number one. And then, then, the obvi- then we like to link it with a paranormal investigation. Excellent. And um, like in Sandin, when we were up there, they let us in all of the closed, locked buildings. There's the White House, the Brown House, the Power Station, the the hotel. All of those buildings are from the eight, late 1800s, all of them. And then the next day, the, the curator there, awesome lady, she's like, you guys uh, should head up to Cody. I'm like, where's Cody? She's like, up the logging road. So we go to this old abandoned Canadian Pacific Railway uh, site. And it was also a Silver Rush site. And it's just all these vacant buildings just sitting there. No graffiti, no nothing. It's just, it's eerie and spooky. And that's what I like. I like finding out the history, but mostly the -the off-the-books history. Where you hear it from the locals, the curators, the historians. And yeah, it's great. That's amazing. Well, that brings up the question as we got about four and a half minutes to go here before we go to break at the bottom of the hour. What you're doing, uh, what you're doing, uh, Gina and Victoria, along with Merle, what your group is doing. I mean, why are there not more groups, and not just in British Columbia, but just out there in general, looking for those vac- those areas? Because if there is that much uncharted and untapped paranormal territory out there, the stories that those ghosts could be able to tell, uh, Gina and Victoria. I mean, this is untapped chartered territory where where you you might be able to to get some actual proof of the history of what happened in that time. Oh, yeah, definitely. And luckily in B.C., we're very lucky because you can pretty much, you know, throw a stone in any direction and there's a haunted location. Right. So or so to speak, like you hear the you know, you hear the stories, like you said. So um, for us, really, it is. um our goal is to mainly ensure, you know, the do- that the documentation is available for future generations, really, mm-hmm. so that, you know, because when stories yeah. are passed down, you know, they, they kind of lose a lot of, they become lost, altered, and so, you know, that's where the extensive research sort of kicks in. Like, you kind of want to make sure that you're verifying with very various sources before you document, and then, you know, it's really exciting, too, when you 
unearth new information about places that hasn't been documented. So that's part of the excitement. So part of the excitement is like sometimes you will get something that'll happen the handful of times if you're lucky. And the majority of the times you won't get anything happening, but you learn something that's new. And I'll be sharing a little bit of um, later on with um, our visit to Irving House because we didn't really have a spectacular like ghostly experience, but something happened afterwards that uncovered like a big piece of a historical, a historically important thing that we'll be sharing with Irving House at some point here very soon. Regina, too, I just also the other thing I do agree. And um, I have to say that with us, when we do our research, we realize actually how much information and time it takes. And I think a lot of people get turned off by that or they don't even realize that there is any information out there. Mm-hmm. They, the first focus is, OK, let's go see if we can find some ghosts or, you know, you hear a story or urban legend and you head out there and that's all you're focused on sometimes. And you kind of forget to, you know, dig deeper and unearth more information. Plus, I think uh, I also think that people get really kind of um, shy about reaching out and talking to people to verify things because, you know. I mean, let's face it, to like knock on somebody's door and go, hey, yeah. tell me about the ghosts, you know, I mean, isn't <laughs> always, spooky people. <laughs> yeah, isn't quite always like the approach, like you don't know how to approach that. But then when you find, you know, a lot of times once you start doing that, you know, it's not that people think you're crazy or that you're, any, you know, kind of off your rocker, but they sort of want to tell their story because I think a lot of people have experiences where they don't really want to say anything no. for some no. reason or they don't share it. But then when somebody comes along and says, hey, I kind of want to hear, you know, what's going on or what your experience was, all of a sudden, you you know, they can't stop talking to you about it. I've got a neighbor who's like talks off my ear about stuff that's happened to him since, <laughs> you know, since I kind of told him what we were doing. And so um, he himself could be a radio show. I mean, I've talked to him that <laughs> extensively for hours on end. Our emails are like, you know, five, six pages long to where I have to print them out. But, you know, he's more than happy to tell me information. So I think it's just also, you know, you you feel a little bit shy about saying anything or, you know, maybe if you feel self-conscious, but really once you open people up, they are more than willing to give you um, give you some stories, give you like, you know, like Merle said, people will say like, oh, drive up there or go to this location. Like people will give you that information. So you just I think you just have to go for it. And we're not and a lot all... of people, and a lot of people are excited by that, and yes. you know they're excited in these small towns when all of a sudden these ghost hunters come on mm-hmm. in and, and and they want to you know whatever you want to call yourself I mean just have fun call it ghost hunters you know mm-hmm. and uh, I think that as we go to break here at the bottom of the hour I think that people are excited when they're in a small community and there's somebody wanting to look into their history even if it is from a paranormal way we are going to get more into paranormal stories coming up here our yes. special guest tonight on Ghosts of the Great White North from Haunted History BC we have sisters Gina and Victoria and of course the legend Legendary Merle is here with us as well. Ghost stories on Ghosts of the Great White North coming up next. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. 
You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is watching. Hey, everybody. The SOR Space Travelers is open. For just 5 bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. If you like it hot, real hot then heat up your meals with bumblefoot hot sauce get your bumblefoot hot sauce today the sauce bumblelicious and the four million scoville unit bumble we're going in hot real hot coming out even hotter keep the milk nearby and tantalize your taste buds tonight bumblefoot hot sauce available now at kajans.com Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, Space Travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience has proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. For more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. We're taking Sunday nights out of this world on Spaced Out Radio. This is Michael W. Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer. Together, we're going to go on an exciting journey into the unknown. I'm going to bring you some of the best interviews in the paranormal and supernatural to start your new week off on a freaky note. So tune in to Spaced Out Sundays with me, Michael W. Hall, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Good to be with you all tonight, tuning on in. 
Reminder that if you miss portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button, our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. On Twitter, follow us at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking Ghosts of the Great White North as Merle is back from a paranormal adventure along with our special guest tonight, Gina and Victoria from HauntedHistoryBC.com. And we're going to get into some ghost stories here because, Merle, I got to tell you, you know, I, I kind of tipped off Gina and Victoria about your near-death experience with with Mandy the Haunted Doll. Oh, scary. Is this, uh, you want me to tell a story now? Well, well that's we usually might, what yeah, we do on we radio, right? Mandy. We've never seen her, so we've never actually seen Mandy. So um, we know she's in Quinnell. She in lives in a glass case. Um, you know, we know how she was found. There's a woman who was cleaning out her attic, apparently, and uh, her grandma's attic, I think it was right after she had a baby. She was cleaning it out, found this doll, took the doll home. And while the doll was residing at her house, um, she would hear crying and all kinds of noises and things. So she thought, you know what? I got to get this thing out of my house and decided to uh, give it to the museum. So now Mandy's there. So we were very intrigued when we heard about the fact that, you know, there was a near death experience with Merle, so we we want to hear that. <laughs> All right, the big near death. Um, this was probably 2015. We were at that point. I've been investigating for about ten ish ten ish years, um, but I'd never experienced haunted objects like this. I always thought they were skeptical. I'm like, if things can't move, like dolls can't walk around because it's a doll. Right? That, that's, that was my thought process going into this, and that's what we were there to document it to see if things happen. And um, that night we were setting up, we were looking at the doll, joking around and whatnot. And uh, one of our investigators, he was just staring at it. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And he wouldn't talk to any of us. He was just staring. He wasn't blinking. He he looked like he pressed pause and he was just staring. And I can be annoying to people sometimes because that's just how I am. And I started just snapping my fingers around his ears and his face. Wouldn't move. Nothing like that. And then he just woke up and he was all startled. And then he went out. He's like, I got to go outside and get some air. So he goes outside and gets some air and he vomits all over the place. And he had no recollection of what happened. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. All right. And um, then, then I go in and I look at the doll. I'm watching the doll's eyes. I'm just staring in the doll's eyes. And I didn't really, I didn't feel much at that time. And then um, I'm like, yeah, whatever. It's a doll. And then when I went outside to go get a snack before we started, because we usually have a little snack and, like, have some energy drinks before we do our nighttime investigation. And all of a sudden, what I remember is walking towards Highway 1 and my teammates coming out to wake me up and grab me, where I was literally going to walk into traffic. I don't remember that. I don't remember doing that. That's something I would never do. Mm -hmm. And... That kind of had me a little shaky. But it's funny we're talking about the story because I was talking about it last night, too. And the part that I forgot to add um, was we rolled two high-quality Sony cameras plugged in. Like, this is after our investigation because we wanted to leave stuff rolling when we left. And we left an audio recorder rolling when the museum was locked up and closed. And then when we were reviewing the evidence, we hear a shuffle. And then both cameras just turn off at the same time. Crap. Yeah, that, that, that's the part that I don't know how I forgot that, but one of my team members reminded me of that when we were telling the story last night. That is very creepy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's Mandy the doll. Yeah, I know. And I know that people at the museum uh, oftentimes said things like um, their lunches would go missing, not to be found. Um, pens would go missing. They would hear footsteps. Um, and one of the reasons they didn't want to put, you know, Mandy with any other dolls because they actually thought that she would harm the other dolls. So, you know, she sits there and staff have had really strange, strange things happen with her in there. So they've heard like a big crash when they come running. There's nothing out of place. Uh, and some say that the case kind of cracks open every so often. And like there's a little lamb type like stuffed lamb that sits in her lap. 
every so often um, it's outside of the case when the case is still locked. So that is extremely creepy. Yeah, what's, that's what's, a, in, what's interesting about that, though, is almost on a weekly or biweekly basis, the museum curators get these psychics who come in who claim to clear the doll of all the energy. And they're like, we just shake our heads because it never goes away. And they all know about her. You know, mm-hmm. my own. Per- now, I haven't had an experience with Mandy. However, in the back of that museum, of the Quinell British Columbia Museum, there is a soldier mannequin standing there. Mm-hmm. Now, I was kind of, when Mike and the team there were doing their part of setting up and doing, I just went off and meandered. You know, this was uh, the night before all of this happened. And I, I, I go into the back part of the museum, and I love military items. Okay? I'm a military buff. I've never served in the military. I always wanted to. Got a ton of respect for anybody who has or is a veteran or is currently serving. And so I come across all of this these items uh, and from World War One and World War Two, and they have this mannequin standing there dressed in World War One garb. And beside that, they have this giant patch quilt that tells the history of Quinell. Okay, and this patch quilt is literally about twelve feet by twelve feet. It is massive. And I'm standing there looking at this patch quilt and I see out of the corner of my right eye, the mannequin move and lean over to look at me to see what I was looking at. And then as I kind of, I got startled by it. And as I turned to look at the mannequin and I was jumping back, it jumped back. And I was like, I was like, holy crap. I can't believe I just saw this. So I quickly, you know, meander back and like, you know, we grab a K2 meter. My friend Corey, who is with me, uh, hanging out with the team. And we go over there and I put a K2 right to the face. And I'm whispering right in this mannequin's ear. I saw you. I know what you did. Do it again. You know, and I'm just freaking out that this mannequin's going to, you know, come out alive and go, boo. And like, I would have died right there. I would have. Yeah, luckily we've never any any doll experiences so far so you know we have yet to see mandy but um but about mandy Mm -hmm. a similar Mm -hmm. story like that uh actually one of the staff members i think they're taking photos of her Mm -hmm. and apparently the same thing happened Mm -hmm. like they were taking pictures they're doing a photo shoot and they swear that the head moved oh my god yeah and so yeah haven't had any any doll experiences but um experience that we kind of want to share so our very first experience that um sticks out in our mind is um when we got drawn back into the land of ghosts it was because we did a ghostly walks tour and we did it in victoria in 2017 and so it's you know a great way to learn about hauntings really get a good tour of the city and everything and we've never done a ghostly walk before and um just in case somebody thinks it's kid stuff these things are creepy because you're in the middle of the night you're walking around you know all these back alleys and everything and then you have a really good storyteller. And we were really, really lucky because we had um, Ian Gibbs who wrote um, Victoria's Most Haunted. So we had him as a tour guide. So that was a really, really lucked out there. And so um, we got to know all these locations. We read the book and everything. So we thought, okay, we're going to go to the Pendre Inn. So we went to the Pendre Inn and checked in and then one one night we went for a walk so we went for a walk in the area it was about 10 o'clock at night we got back and the Pendre Inn's kind of creepy because all the staff goes home at around 9 30 at the front desk yeah it feels like you're staying at a house yeah so you're in there there's other guests there but we were there in the middle of the week so there wasn't really anybody around we were at 10 o'clock and so we were sitting in one of the tea rooms because the tea rooms were uh, set up already for the next day, but we thought we'd just care- carefully sit there and kind of hang out for a bit before we, you know, call it a night or whatever. And so we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I kind of duck out and I see something fly by. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking it's like a, like a an bug. insect or a bug or something. So I look down, and it's a wine cork that just flew by. So I thought, okay, well, how how do you explain that? How, where did it come from? There's nobody else in there. We're sitting there. 
So we kind of ignored that. And the funny thing is, even when you experience something and you believe in paranormal or you believe in the possibility of paranormal, you are always trying to explain it, like with your logical mind. You think, okay, there's got to be a reason. There's got to be, you know, something fell, somehow it, somehow you try to rationalize. So we thought, okay, well, let's get out of here and let's just kind of poke around and creep around and see if we, you know, find anything because we're lucky enough to have uh, the place kind of almost to ourselves. So we went into one of the dining rooms and all of these old hotels, the thing they have in common is like the old wood and everything's dark and, you know, everything's kind of just eerie anyway. So we're poking around one of the dining rooms um, in the dark. I don't know why we didn't turn on the light. You know, you always yell at those people in those horror movies, like, turn on the light. We didn't turn on the light either. We had our like our flashlights on our phones and we're just creeping around. We want to create the atmosphere, right? <laughs> yeah, we didn't really want anybody to think like we're lurking around either because you just don't know, like, if the, you know, do they have cameras, the staff watching or whatever. So we're poking around in one of the dining rooms and they have a big bookshelf. We're looking at the books and all of a sudden, in the pitch black, we hear, the, a voice, like a really whispery voice, I can see you. So we thought, oh, my God. Okay, so first of all, I thought it was my husband, Bill, because he was in the room with me. So I kind of sh shined my flashlight on him. And I said, did you do that? And he's like, no. We were all completely, completely stunned. So oh, we, we heard this. We were just this. frozen. We just stood there. We were just frozen. We're like, okay, okay, did we really, on? really hear that? Yeah. So we looked around and everything. At that point, we did turn on light. We started looking around. We saw these two speakers in the corner of each in each corner of the room, kind of like just, I don't know, mounted up there. So we thought, well, is it, is it the, like, is somebody playing a trick on us? Or, That's what we were initially thinking. Yeah. So we thought, does yeah. the staff go home? Do they have cameras? Do they see us lurking around? Is somebody just kind of messing around? So I thought, okay, we're, you know, we're going to get out of there and kind of sit in the foyer. They had some nice chairs. There was a fireplace. And we thought, okay, just, just for kicks, we're going to do the whole question answer thing. Now, mind you, when we go out on these things, we don't have like crazy equipment no. or anything like that. We just go, you know, at best we have a digital recorder at this point. We haven't invested in anything. And we're sitting there and we, you know, we start talking to, is anybody there kind of a thing? Because with the Pendre Inn, we've heard that guests have stayed in a particular room. I think it's room number five and where they kind of wake up and they see these ghostly heads kind of in a green mist sort of floating above the bed. And it's, and it's thought to be uh, William Pendre who's, you know, built the place and his son. So they kind of died tragically. So every, you know, every so often he's this story of these ghostly heads, but we didn't see those. But so then we're sitting at the um, fireplace and we start asking some questions. Well, wouldn't, you know, we hear the tapping. We did the typical, like one for yes, two for no. And we just sat there. We thought, are we really hearing this for real? And we were. We, we, we tried it again then. We tried it again with another question. And the tapping sure enough, continued. the tapping yeah. starts again. So we thought, oh, my gosh, what is going on here? Because you kind of want to believe it and you're excited. But at the same time, you're thinking, oh, this can't be happening. That's so incredible. from there. <laughs> From there, the night got kind of weirder. And we thought, okay, wait, great. You know, we experienced something. It's getting late. Let's just kind of call it a night and go to bed. So Victoria goes into her room. My husband and I go into the other room. You know, somehow we get to sleep, which is always kind of amazing because, you know, you're kind of freaked out anyway. But we fell asleep. And then um, probably at the, around like 3.40 in the morning, like all of a sudden, really loud music in our room. I kind of lurch, look, start looking around. You're half asleep. I'm waking up my husband like, oh, my God, I think an alarm's going off because you think you're in a, you know, you're in a hotel and you think there's going to be a clock radio. So I'm just looking at my, I'm looking at my nightstand and I kind of think, OK, there's got to be something I can turn off. Where's this music coming from? So my husband's looking on his side. There's nothing on his side. We look over to the TV. Well, his, we finally realized that it, it was his phone that was playing music. It wasn't an alarm. It was actually like a tune that started. It was oddly Elton John's Someone Saved My Life Tonight, which is kind of <laughs> creepy. But it was playing. Like you would have to go into the iPhone, put your password in, select the tune, and play it. So how that happened, we have no idea. Very unexplained. Um, we kind of, you know, tried to think about it afterwards. And, you know, the next morning we got up, we went downstairs. We were all having our tea and biscuits or whatever. 
And we thought, you know, just nonchalantly, we're going to pry the staff a little bit, like especially about this disembodied voice. We were thinking, we heard this, you know, it was clear as day. We heard it. So we kind of asked the staff, well, we noticed you have this dining room. So what do you guys use that for? You know, and they would tell us, oh, people have events in there. And I kind of mentioned the speakers. I want to see their speakers. So can people play music? And the woman there says, oh, you know what? Those haven't worked for years. They were disconnected. So (laughs) that answered that question. So where we heard that, why we heard it, still to this day, um, can't prove anything. We didn't have anything that we caught on tape. Um, but that was our creepy story about the Pendre Inn. So that is freaky. uh, That was freaky. freaky. It was one of the most, like one after another things were happening and we didn't know uh, why on that night we'd heard things. Um, uh, yeah, it was just, uh, one of those things just that you just don't forget. (laughs) When you ladies are investigating, this is the one thing that I like about you ladies. Okay. You make no bones about it. You are doing it for fun. You are doing it for the thrill. You're not trying to solve anything. You're not trying to play the television star or anything like that. How have you kind of taken to the paranormal with Haunted History BC and turned that into just a, a fun course of events, whereas so many other paranormal investigators, they're trying to lock down locations. They want locations to sign contracts. They're trying to to bolster their presence and take over a province or a state in the U.S. You know, they're just trying to have all of this egomaniacal way of, of conducting the paranormal, and yet here you ladies are. You do your own thing. You kind of just kind of go with the flow and you just want to share the experiences that you are having as well as others. Why have you chosen that path rather than what is so prevalent in the paranormal today? Vicki, let's start with you. Well, I think probably, too, for us, it's like we really can't prove or disprove what people's experiences. We can't say, yes, they are paranormal. Or they, they aren't. And, um, but then we are always very open to um, hearing people's stories. And I think that's what kind of captures our interest. And it allows us to go into an area then to look at it from both sides. We, we take the paranormal side, the stories behind it, but we also do research on it. And, and you know what? Realistically, I think as being history buffs, we actually love the history side of things. And that's what keeps us going. And then when we start delving deeper into like the location, we, we actually uncover a lot of interesting things. And um, they were like, hey, we didn't know anything about this area or this or this area. You know, like we're, we're quite fascinated by the research and, and also like the, the history and the background of the area. And, you know, um, like I said, people may have experiences. Some are maybe more sensitive to others. Like, you know, they might pick up on something. We, we probably do and we don't. You know, it mm-hmm. just depends. But I, I think that for the most part, it's just the history that attracts us. And as you start digging deeper into the into location – you realize that, oh, wow, that, you know, I didn't realize this. And we lived here for so many years. Mm-hmm. You know, it just becomes more fascinating. And you want to share that with people this way. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think, too, we um, when initially we started, when it started with just the calendar project, mm-hmm. we were hoping um, as we start, we started working on it last November. But we really started gearing up and kicking up the project probably around um, January or February. Mm-hmm. And it was right during when everything was happening and all of a sudden people couldn't travel. So we thought, you know what, we want to bring history to people. So if you can't necessarily get out right now and get there, um, we can present something that's, you know, that has a little bit of that. And maybe, you know, we've gotten a lot of comments on people who have gone to the website or just even looked at the calendar and, and tell us, you know, this brings back some great memories just from even just from a historical standpoint, because I went to this location Mm -hmm. and I went to that location. And that's really kind of what we took from our experience of, of reading a lot of books on, you know, because we read Ian Gibbs, um, you know, Victoria's most haunted. And then we went and did read um, the hauntings of Vancouver Island, Shannon Sin. And so those things kind of inspired us. Yeah. yeah. And so we inspired us, those inspired us to kind of check out locations. And so we're kind of trying to inspire people to do the same thing, whether or not you do it from a haunted perspective, you know, if you want to take that route, great. But, you know, just the historical part in itself is always very interesting. And, you know, listening to people tell the stories or people who have been in a city for a long time and who know the city's history, it's very interesting to chat with them 
and you know just to just to learn everything you can about a location and that's always intriguing in itself so um right we we, we did only, notice we only, not a lot of people are doing that so we we only got about three minutes here before we got to go to break merle you got a question no i was just gonna say uh add on to what they were saying we go history first as well and i find like i'll use my one of the recent ones sandon bc that place we did our history on it we read our like everything on it and um it connects you to the location and like before we even thought about investigating and we do this everywhere we go now a lot is day and night one we won't even investigate we will walk around we'll take photos we'll feel it out yeah we'll read every piece of information there and we'll speak to the curators the locals the staff and get their advice on how and when we should investigate and then it's usually night two, nights two and three when we will actually do our investigation and see if we can link the history with the paranormal up. Awesome. Yeah, and that's kind of like us too. Like we try to take the journalistic approach. We we like to like look into everything and check with a lot of different people. Um, not just go with one tip, a typical story and just say, hey, yeah, okay, it's haunted or there's you know, paranormal activity. We really do our research and we look and talk to different people about that. Yeah. And when we reached out to people about our project, we actually um, appreciated the fact that they did correct us on a couple of things. So I think that's the other thing. You can't go into it thinking, oh, now that I've done the research and I've done all the reading, I'm the only person who knows about it because there are other people who have experienced it, who have looked into it a lot longer than we have. So you kind of have to respect like the experience that is in the field and, you know, grab onto those people who, you do respect and then you can kind of go from there so um i think we you know we felt comfortable enough doing with that people with a few people and we really appreciate their honest feedback you know we Mm -hmm. don't want we don't want to have a floofy like oh yeah that's really nice but if something's wrong then you've got to tell us the information's wrong and this is what it really is so and this is who i talk to about it so you know then at that point you kind of make a little make a little correction or a little adjustment and you want to present it um, as truthfully and as authentically as possible. Truth. We got about a minute to go here, and uh, you know, ladies, w- w- I, one thing that I that I appreciate with what you're saying is just the honesty behind the investigation. A lot of paranormal teams don't have that honesty, and it leads to the blog that I wrote last week in regards to you know one of the reasons why you know myself and a lot of people have fallen out of love with the paranormal. So I think what you guys are doing is fantastic because you're almost bringing a sense of storytelling through the eyes of the ghosts and the communication that you're getting. And a lot of people aren't doing that, especially the weekend warriors. So you guys need to be commended for that. And and I know, uh, you know, I could compliment Merle on that too, because I know the way his team uh, works in that fashion as well. And that's really the way it should be done. If we're not trying to solve anything, let's try and have some fun. Especially being so new, we really do appreciate that because it is a great compliment. And, you know, it it kind of just proves to us that we're really on the path that we want to be on because we are actually, you know, presenting that to people in, in the way that we want to present it. Perfect. Ladies, you hold on, and Merle, you hold on as well, because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. Ghosts of the Great White North happens once a month, where my good buddy Merle comes in from Paranormal Road Trippers, hangs on out, talks some ghost stories. Tonight's special guest from hauntedhistorybc.com, we have the sister team of Gina and Victoria. More ghost stories from around British Columbia coming up next on Ghosts of the Great White North. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. 
The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, Space Travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, Space Travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. This is Amber Beckrud, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines Report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. 
I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumble Fuck? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumble f- Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning us on in. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. All of our archives are free for you at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Parabolanus. Parabolanus is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on here with Ghosts of the Great White North. We got Merle here from Paranormal Road Trippers hanging on out after a five-day, five-location ghost hunt around British Columbia, and our special guests tonight, sisters Gina and Victoria, they have a great website that you want to check out called hauntedhistorybc.com, where they take a look at the history of some of British Columbia's biggest and best paranormal legends. Everyone, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for being here. All right, we're back. And um, yeah, so we talked a little bit, quite a bit about Victoria. And of course, that's very haunted and people know that it's haunted. So I just kind of want to shift gears a little bit and talk about our experience at the um, Irving House in New Westminster, B.C. So that is in our neck of the woods. It's about, you know, 40 minutes away from where we live. Uh, It's a historic house that was built in 1865 and a lovely colonial home. And was the residence of uh, Captain William Irving. And he was known as the King of the Fraser River. So it was our first time um, visiting that particular location. And it's a beautiful heritage house. So in New Westminster, B.C. And we had a great tour guide. So that's the other thing we do like every so often where we have a tour guide that can take you throughout. Um, There's 14 rooms in the house. So there's a lot to see. So we went through the house and the tour guide told us about the history of the Irving family, some of the descendants, and we were lucky enough to actually see some of the thing belongings that actually belonged to them. So that was really kind of cool. And uh, one of the nice things about the architecture at the time was that uh, William Irving really loved his ships. So it had a lot of, you know, Gothic features. It had a lot of features for um, a lot of, features of ships and he liked, you know, that decor. So a lot of the walls had like the ship lap and a lot of nautical type of themes. So that was really cool to see too. So you could tell that he really loved his time um, on the sea and the day we picked a visit was really perfect. So um, because we only had one other person on the tour with us. So we kind of felt like we had all to ourselves. And so um, the last members of the Irving family that lived in the house was until about the 1950s. So they used it fairly recently And then, like happens to many heritage sites, it did get uh, sold to the city of New Westminster, which uh, and they preserved it, thank goodness, because um, not a lot of people know this, but uh, New Westminster had a great fire and it was in 1898 or whatever. Yes, I think 1898. And uh, a lot of heritage houses there were kind of wiped out. So we were really happy that this one still exists. And we didn't have anything ghostly. Um, We went through the rooms and everything, and it was a great experience. 
But we did ask our tour guide if anybody ever experienced anything paranormal. And they did. She said um, they informed us that uh, several staff members and vi- visitors would occasionally smell pipe smoke. That was quite a exactly quite a common occurrence. Um, they would hear the faint sound of bagpipes, which is kind of strange. Like they don't oh, know. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, so they would hear it either in the house or outside on the ground. So I'm not really sure. But she said they often um, heard bagpipes. A, a couple of rare occasions, she said. Uh, from the staircase, there would be a white feather that would float down out of nowhere <laughs> during the tours. So we didn't experience the white feather or anything like that. But the tobacco smoke. But the tobacco we smoke. Did yes, sense we did smell smoke. something. Yeah. So it was, you know, kind of. And she said, yeah, tobacco and pipe smoke has a very, very unique smell. So usually people can tell a little bit of the difference. But one of the things, and here's where the history part kicks in, Um we were drawn to the story of uh, Mary Aline Cox, and she was one of the granddaughters of Captain Irving. So she ended up uh, writing about her grandfather. She wrote um, Saga of a Seafarer about his adventures uh, on the ships and everything. So that kind of caught my attention because I thought kind of being a dabbler with, you know, writing and everything, it, it intrigued me that she was a writer. So I thought, made a note of it because we are geeks and we take notebooks to these things so I kind of made a note to look it up later and you know it wasn't a book that you would be finding like on Amazon or anything you know this is an old book so (laughs) I had to do a little bit of searching but we did find copies of the book and so I ordered a couple copies and then um, I found them in various places on the internet some old bookstores and then I just set them aside because I kind of wanted to know more and I set those books aside, and then about a couple of weeks later, I thought, well, let me look at these, you know, because they were signed copies, which was kind of really cool, too. So I kind of started looking through them, and um, lo and behold, in one of them, I found a typed letter from Mary Eileen Cox to her publisher. So for the average person, like, you think, oh, it's just a typed letter, but for us, I mean, we freaked out when we exciting. found this thing. Yeah. It was really, really exciting to find <laughs> this, because... You know, those things just didn't survive. It was like if we wrote a letter now, I mean, who's going to keep that, right? So yeah. we were really excited. It was a typed letter. It was hand um, signed by her to her publisher in New York. And that was like one of the coolest things we found. Called um, me in the middle of the night when you found that out. So Yes, I did. I <laughs> called her and I was like, oh, my gosh. And I took pictures of it on my cell phone. I'm like, oh, my God, I found this letter. And it just was the completest, completely nerdy thing Regina to do. Regina found the Holy Grail. <laughs> and I know it was like that. And all it was is this letter. But, you know, eventually we're doing some other research on the Irving House because we want to do a little project around that. But eventually what we hope to do, and this is kind of what we, uh, what, why we're in this, exactly. is that we want to have this letter framed and we want to donate it back to the Irving House because that's where it really needs to go. And it needs to go with a copy of the book. And we hope that like somewhere in October we can contact them and, you know, and have this happen for, you know, and yeah. so that was our big thing. So we didn't have anything ghostly happen, but I will backtrack a little bit. So I did take a couple of outside photos. Oh yes. Um, and we did catch what looked like a couple of green orbs and they had kind of the nebula around them. I kind of had a people look at them to kind of scrutinize them and all that. So we are not really sure what we caught. I caught them in a couple of different places. Um, one looked like it was sitting deep within the grass and it kind of like had a little halo. And then one was at the front of the house. And that's where the tour guide kind of told us that from the inside of the house, like that big window, um, people have actually seen apparitions kind of gliding through and out the window. So that is my Irving house story. <laughs> That is incredible. Absolutely incredible that you would share that. Thank you so much for that. I want to get into another story around here because, you know, one of the most popular places that does not allow paranormal investigation and you can't get into the buildings, I think, unless you have a a multi-million dollar insurance policy is the old Riverview Hospitals. Now, Riverview for people who, who wow, wow. yeah. We now, for a lo- for for a lot of people out there who do not know, this was like you know, for our American friends, it it would be like Waverly Hills. Okay, or the Trans Allegheny Asylum. Yes, Trans- exactly. Trans-Allegheny. Okay. I've seen stuff on Trans-Allegheny. 
Yeah, so so this is what it's like. However, they don't allow paranormal investigation in there, and these buildings are just sitting there, and, you know, it is rife for the picket for the paranormal, but they don't want that type of reputation. The buildings are, are falling apart. Some, some areas are, are almost to the point where they're condemned. And, you know, they do a lot of movie filming in there, though, which is yes. which is really weird. And, and talking to people in the in the film industry, they seem to have a lot of strange activity there. But you can investigate out on the grounds and there is a graveyard there. Now, yes. uh, before I bring Gina and Victoria in, Merle, have you ever investigated the grounds there? I have investigated the grounds. Um it's kind of eerie there. I obviously, like any other investigator, would love to get inside one day, but they're really they're sticklers on you. If you park too long or you hang out around a building too long, security's on you like flies on crap when you're there. It it's so locked down, and there's signs everywhere like no metal detecting, no loitering, no after dark. So it's really difficult to even do an EVP session without getting bugged. You know the funny thing is um, we. Uh, we went we went there um, on a weekend, During the and day, I think yeah. we saw one security guy. So we must have really lucked out because we were on the grounds, I think, for, for about four and a half hours. We and one of the things that mo- motivated us to go there is um, uh, one of the other books that we read was uh, The Ghosts of Vancouver by Greg Mansfield. And so when he got a copy of our calendar, he said, hey, I really want to do a haunted vancouver calendar so will you guys collaborate and we we said of course we jumped at it we were like of course we're going to you know collaborate with you we'd love it so we we actually went on a picture taking expedition a couple of weeks ago with greg and another friend of his who's into the paranormal he's a photographer so we all went as a group and we were on the grounds for quite a while but i actually contacted the admin staff Mm -hmm. and i did ask them about the the parking and whatnot and the permission and and they they allowed that and they just taken basically they took our numbers down Mm -hmm. and our names basically and um but otherwise they were okay with it and they they did a follow-up with us the next day too just to see that if we were all okay and if uh we were able to capture the information we wanted Mm -hmm. so yeah and so the most interesting stories that I have, um, yeah, we didn't experience anything on the grounds other than we took some amazing pictures and the place is like really eerie as hell. Um, the dilapidated buildings and, you know, it's, it's a little bit heartbreaking too because, you know, you see these beautiful, beautiful buildings, what's, what once were beautiful buildings and they were just sort of let go after a while. And I think they're having some sort of a revival of some of them. They're trying to do that, but a lot of them, you know, are still... And just for the folks who don't really are not familiar with the Riverview mm-hmm. Hospital, um, the hospital was actually for the mentally ill patients, and mm-hmm. it has a history stretching back to about 110 years. Yes. So it's it's been around for a very yeah. It very opened long in like, like like 1913 or something is when it opened, mm-hmm. and it closed in 2012 for and, good. So. Right. And the hospital housed thousands of patients, but unfortunately, in the 1980s, the government decided to close close down majority of the wards. I think currently, right now, in existence, there's only three that are actually functioning. Three wards that are functioning there. And so, yeah, I do have a haunted um, story about the cemetery, however. Like, um, Dave, like you mentioned, there's a lot of filming that goes on. And I know a couple of people who uh, I've spoke to in the film industry because I have I work with a lady and her uh, husband has worked for the film industry. And then also other people that I've worked for, uh, worked in there doing, extent, spending extensive time there. They've all experienced something freaky. So, um there is ghostly activity. So I'm going to kind of read a little bit of my excerpt from the website. Sure. I did post this on the website go, go here. Go right ahead. And so um, there are many reports of ghostly activity all around the Riverview grounds and buildings. The cemetery is no exception. Two local men who worked on film projects regularly said there were many unnerving experiences, and most of them took place inside the dilap- dilapidated buildings. However, one of the men recalled a time when he was inside He was out on a break strolling the grounds, and he unknowingly ended up at the cemetery. He said he was puzzled to see a woman in old-fashioned clothing and a hat looking like she was doing some gardening. The man was confused, as he believed her to be one of the actors on the set, except that the outfit was all wrong. He was even more puzzled when she seemed not to pay attention to him walking by. She didn't look up, didn't notice him, and as he walked back towards the abandoned buildings, He quickly glanced behind him, and he was surprised to see that the woman was no longer there. 
The man asked some of the film crew if another company was filming there because he said he saw a woman dressed in an odd outfit. One man on the film crew confirmed that they were the only ones on site and not even visitors could come on the grounds while the filming was in progress. Another man reluctantly admitted seeing the same woman days earlier and he too saw her gardening but thought this was strange as it was pouring rain. Inexplicably, the woman didn't seem to be getting affected by the rain, and stranger still, her clothes didn't seem to be wet. The man thought it best not to mention the incident and only admitted to it when his co-worker mentioned seeing her. The men nervously chalked it up to be yet another chilling incident on their list while working at the Riverview grounds. Needless to say, even in broad daylight, neither one of the men walked past the cemetery on their breaks for the duration of the film project. So that was my Riverview creepy cemetery story. Interesting. So the yeah, gardener. That's, that's not cool. The, so we don't know who the gardener is. I mean, the, the cemetery grounds are interesting because as we looked at all the stones, um, they're very basic markers. They're not like, like a cemetery that you would notice. So when we are first arrived there, we thought, okay, we did all the grounds and now it. we are trying to find the cemetery. So yeah. we couldn't find it. We were, you know, searching, searching. There was a bit of a confusion because we couldn't see, we were expecting to see like headstones and we didn't see that. So then we finally turned and saw the indents in the, in the grounds. And we thought, Oh, here it is. We're literally almost like standing on it. So we went and looked around and you know, there's only the patient's first initial, their last names and when they died. So not much is known about the people there. So that's what, one thing we found out in our research is that there wasn't much to research just because nobody knows anything about it really I mean they know that people are buried there they know you know some names they don't know they know some people are patients some loved ones that are you know buried beside them there and then there's some staff yeah they don't have records yeah and not all the patients at Riverview were either um were always buried at Riverview either like in the earlier parts you know Fraser Cemetery in New Westminster was used for a lot of um, people who passed away there in the beginning till about the 1920s and then Riverview, Riverview started being used. And there was also some overflow into another local hospital in U.S. Minster um, called Woodlands. So at that time, that was another mental hospital, eventually like a troubled boys school and all that. But some people are buried in Woodlands and there's not very many records. So there's not records you can look at. No. So we found that there's a lot of um, people in the community still searching for information and they're trying to piece it together as to who exactly is buried there. Um, the earliest person buried there that we found was uh, 1929. There was a headstone. So, you know, they're saying 1958, but 1928 makes, 1929 makes sense just because when okay. Fraser Cemetery in New Westminster was stopped being used, um, the Riverview grounds started being used more often. So the latest person, the most recent person uh, buried there was in 2012, and it was an unmarked grave. It's just uh, Jane Doe. Jane Doe, yeah. And so nobody knows who she is. We assume that she's probably a patient. We don't know. Um, but there was no records. Her, her body was donated to science and they did research and so on. So, you know, sometimes I think when people have experiences of hauntings, it's because the ghosts kind of want something from you. You know, whether it's like recognition or they want you to find out more or... I don't know. There's some, there's a feeling of unrest because it felt like a very sad and heavy place. And mind you, we went on a sunny day. So, you know, it should have felt all nice and bright and everything, but you start kind of wandering around and it felt, I don't know. Did it feel that way to you, Victoria? Kind of, kind of oppressed. Yeah. I would say that, yeah, just, it, it was, look, it just felt desolate. Like when we yeah. walked in there, that's exactly what we kept saying that just like hardly no one's around, just nothing. Like that's it. Very quiet. Yeah, so it'd be a very creepy place if you had an experience. It would freak you out. Um, you probably wouldn't want to pass by there. So, yeah, that's that's our Riverview story. <laughs> Merle, I got to ask you in in regards to the Riverview Hospital. Why are they so adamant against paranormal teams going in there? I think it's the movie, the paranormal movies that have been filmed there doesn't shed a good light on our research and what we do. Also, it's unsafe there, and I don't think it's – I think the people that own it or run it may think, look at it as a lack of respect to the people who passed away or who were there during well, their and stint. One the, and the, one of the folks I spoke to, I made contact with somebody who uh, did the set building. They said a lot of the buildings have a lot of asbestos still, 
So they're very leery about letting people in because there's a lot of like toxic chemicals. There's a really terrible smell of like the chemicals and the medicines or whatever, the, you know, stuff that they use. So they're kind of leery about letting people in for that reason as well is what I hear. Interesting. We've got about three and a half minutes before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Merle with Ghost of the Great White North and our special guest from hauntedhistorybc.com, Gina and Victoria. You know, when when it comes to these type of asylums, there aren't a lot in British Columbia to go with that. You know, yet they are a paranormal hotspot, especially for paranormal tourism in the United States. Outside of this one, Merle, are there any other areas uh, or asylums or or that are open to investigation? No. Um, there's one in Kamloops, the Tranquil. Oh, yeah, the TV ward. Yeah, that one. Um, mm-hmm. they, they let you walk the grounds. I know of teams that say that they're getting into it, but seeing and believing is one. Um, we were going to stop there on the way home today, but... We didn't, <laughs> since we drove drove through Kamloops. But no, that one is a daytime tour only. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting. You would think, though, that with these buildings just kind of sitting there, that collecting dust, costing a lot of money for security, for, for uh, even the land itself... Yeah. And they're doing nothing. You think that they would be a little bit more open to the fact that they could create a a revenue stream using the paranormal there. I agree. But it's again, I think with those type of places, just like residential schools in Canada, I think people shy away from exposed. They don't want to talk about the history and they don't want people they because a lot of people who will investigate, they won't be respectful. They'll want to find the ghost. They'll want to find the the more darker side of things and i think that's what makes i think one bad apple ruins it for other people to go investigate and i think it's a no across the board to that but i agree with you it would make the money especially if they did tours at night yeah and i think the same with uh with woodlands um they said similar things about woodlands that people sort of want to just put the history behind them and they actually for woodlands cemetery we have not um been out there but for that cemetery they actually Back in the day, I think it was in the 60s, they actually removed all of the pavers. So that was a very, like a lot of people thought that was a very disrespectful thing to do because they actually took up all the pavers, stacked them off to the side. Um, Some got taken away. They built a patio with them. And, you know, just people thought it was not handled very well. So I think, you know, there can be a lot of unrest, I guess, in that energy. You know, when you're disturbing kind of a sacred burial space, you know, people are dead there and you're kind of, you know, traipsing around on their territory. So it's it's not a good thing to disturb the dead. We have learned that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I know, like, last year, the, the place in Kamloops, the Tranquil um, Hospital, they did, um, they did like, an escape room there. So mm-hmm. they, they seem clearly okay with doing that stuff. I hmm. think I, I heard a story, and I don't know how true, but up here in Canada, we have a channel called Much Music, which is the Canadian version of MTV. And I heard it during their one of their reality shows that they did a number of years ago. They just tore up the place, and that's what killed it, is they were just very disrespectful to the place, and I guess it, they didn't film it in a very, you know, lack of a better term, positive way, and, and they just were not interested. So that's why I heard the Kamloops, British Columbia one, got shut down. But you guys, i got to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. We have Ghosts of the Great White North, Merle from Paranormal Road Trippers, along with from Haunted History BC, Gina and Victoria. More of Ghosts of the Great White North on Spaced Out Radio continues after this. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. 
So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just 5 bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. We're taking Sunday nights out of this world on Spaced Out Radio. This is Michael W. Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer. Together, we're going to go on an exciting journey into the unknown. I'm going to bring you some of the best interviews in the paranormal and supernatural to start your new week off on a freaky note. So tune in to Spaced Out Sundays with me, Michael W. Hall, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. For more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. 
You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. past the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for tuning us in. I'm Dave Scott hanging out behind the microphone talking about some weird, strange ghosts tonight. I hope you are all enjoying as well. Do me a favor. If you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. On Twitter, follow us at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking Ghosts of the Great White North from Paranormal Road Trippers. We have Merle here. Yes, the Merle is back. All Merle, all day, all night long. And our special guest from hauntedhistorybc.com. We have sisters team of Gina and Victoria. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Great to be We're here. Having We're fun. having a really good time. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Hope I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. All right. Let's get into the Ouija board because there is oh, a lot wait, of... Next. All right. Yeah. Well, we got a lot of people out there who debate, discuss, and are still quite petrified and freaked out of the Ouija board. Mike, I know you feel very open about using it as a communication device. Let's hear about your story at the English Inn with the Ouija board. English boards. Inn. Yes. Wow. So it was the first and only time we've used a Ouija board. Um, we were... We were a little, you know, we were a little twitchy about it because first of all, we read books on how, you know, there's you use a Ouija board and all kinds of demons come forth and you're opening a portal yeah. and, you know, it all sounds very ominous. But we kind of thought, you know, in this case, I bought one. I thought, OK, well, we'll, we'll take it along just for fun. So we went to the English Inn and the English Inn is a very creepy looking place from the outside. So it was one of those places where, you know, you kind of pull up and it's a very Tudor style, like it's kind of dark and, you know, the grounds are all woodsy and everything. And we were lucky enough to go when all the outbuildings were there. I think right now it's closed. It's been closed for a while for renovation. So we're not really sure if it's renovating and if it'll ever open, but we were lucky enough to go when, um, when all the outbuildings were there, like there's a really creepy thatched house because it was like the copy of the Anne Hathaway cottage in England. And so that was there. The Shakespeare house was there. But, um, yeah, this was a 1900s building. So, uh, built around 1909 and, uh, we went in there and it was just one of those things where from the get go, it was one of those times when you sort of just had to be there. Cause it was a very strange arrival as well. So just an odd way it, it was. was, it was like, it just kind of felt off. I don't even know how to really explain it. So it felt like, you know, kind of, you walked in, the staff was all very nice, but it just felt like, you know, it was kind of a group of people that you almost feel like haven't been there before. Like they're trying to help you, you know, get to your look and they were all very lovely people. So we checked in and then almost immediately, like when, as we were coming down the stairs, we had one of the staff members sort of almost kidnap us. And he wanted to kind of give us this history. He was really excited about giving us the history on the building. So he showed us, you know, the family crests and talked about some of the artwork and, you know, took us around. And he took us through this hallway and he was telling us about his family crest, but the hallway was so narrow too. Yes, I I didn't even realize that even that hallway was that narrow. I know it was like, that's the thing about those old buildings. They have all these nooks and crannies. They have they have like hallways that stop and like you think, well, why did they build that? You know, that's just kind of really, really creepy. And one of the really strange things was in Victoria's room. Do you want to talk about your room? Let's no, talk about the, the describe room. Your room. Itself. Okay. Beautiful well, room. But then the room was beautiful. We walked in, you know, we just were checking in at the time. And um, Gina and her husband came in too as well, checked out the area there. And we're like, okay, great. So, you know, we're looking at all the decorations and just everything, but then Gina spotted that, well, your closet looks a little off. So I just kind of happened to open it up there and 
oddly, um, the room wasn't like a full room. There was no window. Um, the door, I mean, the roof was sort of slanted. And we just looked in there, and there was like a like a bed or a cot that was made out there. And I was wondering, well, who would even stay there? Like, for what reason? You know, we just, and we started joking, you know. And Gina's husband, too, he started making jokes about it and saying that, oh, well, this is really kind of quite creepy. I don't think I would even want to stay in this room. The bed was weird because it was all made up. There was like a little nightstand, and I'm thinking, who on earth would sleep in there? I mean, it's a closet. It was the (laughs) creepiest thing ever. So we thought, okay, well, this is kind of starting off good because we're, you know, kind of creeped out, which is kind of why you come to these places, right? So we went to um, uh, that evening. So we finally, you know, kind of settled in everything. And that evening we thought, okay, let's do, let's do a Ouija session. So we kind of read about how to do it right because you're supposed to, like, be very respectful. You go in to do your Ouija session, then you have to say goodbye and do all that so you don't let, let anything in. So your husband was making notes. Yes. While we were doing while we were doing the yeah. session. So what we were doing is um we kind of started, you know, the planchette was the little thing that moves around on the Ouija board. So we kind of put our fingers on it and it's really creepy when you feel it move. Mm-hmm. So it kind of started pulling around, gave us some information. It seemed like um not a really a negative entity, but just somebody who's very agitated. So she seemed very agitated. Um, We got information about that she was upset because there was a wedding that didn't happen. And uh, we kind of felt like it was her wedding because of just the intensity of the emotion. You know, we even asked a name and all of that. And oddly, um, afterwards, looking back on it, I don't remember. We couldn't remember a lot of the things. And I have a pretty good memory. I mean, we weren't kind of writing everything down at like, to the notes. So it was one of those things I've heard that actually experienced by other paranormal groups where you go in, you have this experience and you don't quite recall everything that happened, but we did, you know, we called the name at the time and everything. We had this experience. We kind of thought it was cool. We were a little wigged out, you know, we, uh, and we decided, okay, now we've kind of done that. We've talked to a spirit. We think we're going to say goodbye. And we went down to the lobby and have a drink. We're like, okay, we need to have a drink. We need to go somewhere where it's well lit and, you know, have a little beverage. Um, nobody else was in the bar. But And that night we went to sleep. So that's where, like, the really creepy stuff sort of started happening. So um, my husband and I were trying to get to sleep. And I, not kidding you, at one point we heard the closet door kind of click open and it just kind of creaked open. Now, closet doors... I don't know. We just, everybody's terrified of closet doors. Like you talk to people all across and closet doors are super, super spooky. So here we are in the pitch black, but I can see like the white door. So it's kind of opening up. And of course we freak out. So I just kind of left it. And as we were laying there, we kept hearing things like furniture moving. It sounded like in the dark, like furniture was being moved around the room. So I would like click on the light, see nothing. And so that was really, really scary. And so the next day, we managed to um, have our breakfast and everything. And then we came back, and I forgot about this part till now. Mm -hmm. We came back into the room, and do you remember that we had, like, something written on the mirror? Oh, that's right. It's it said something. I completely spaced that till the other day. It was like it's it was said, and I looked at my picture because I took a picture of it, and it said um, the time. The time, like what time? Like time for what? Like the mirror was fogged. The mirror was fogged because I took a shower, right? And you like get up there and and I saw like it etched into the mirror and I thought, oh my God, that is really super creepy. So that happened. And as we're getting ready to leave, like we're packing up our stuff because we're going from there. We were going from English Inn and then we were going to stay at the Craig Mile Inn, which is right across uh, from Craig Drock Castle. So we could kind of see the castle. So we kind of gathered all our stuff at the English Inn. And as we were doing that, I'm grabbing my suitcase. On. There's a sofa and there's a huge chandelier up above. So as I'm grabbing my bag, I feel something fall on me. I'm like, of course, now we're all freaked out anyway. So I kind of twitch and everything. And I look down and it's a, it's a piece from the chandelier. So it's one of the glass pieces. And as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, well, how on earth did this fall? You're trying to kind of explain it and look up. And I looked at the piece it had a wire on the end, but it wasn't broken. It was solid. And so I'm kind of thinking, well, how on earth did this thing fall on me? 
I almost took it with me, but I thought, oh no, that's the number one rule. You don't break the rule no. of taking anything creepy, haunted, especially after the Ouija board. So I just laid it on the couch. I figured they're going to fix it. They're going to put it back on, you know, on the chandelier. And we ended up leaving for the day. But um, that was really, really creepy. So ever since then, I mean, it wasn't anything negative, but we just kind of thought, you know, we're going to leave, we're going to leave the Ouija alone. Um, we, we have enough stuff out there that, you know, we don't need to be bringing, uh, yeah. bringing forth anything that does, that we don't want to get rid of. And maybe. I don't think we want to do it again. No, no, definitely not. No, it creeps me out because since then we've read books and then we like, we've read books on shadow people and sometimes they manifest through Ouija board. I don't know. I'm we just, just, we like to consider ourselves as hard skeptics, but still at the same time, I'm a little bit it, superstitious. We, I do have exactly. to admit. <laughs> do you, um, with the Ouija boards, do you guys use any other tools to communicate with spirits? Oh, not at this moment. No. I mean, I have Just things like, yeah, I have, we had flashlights and we had um, things recorders. like um, digital recorders. Um, we didn't capture anything. Um, I have things like, I mean, some people I know use tarot cards. I do have them. I have not used them for that purpose. Um, but uh, so far, no. No, we just use the Ouija. I, uh, I posted about a Ouija board about a week ago on a couple of different paranormal groups, and I'm still getting flack over it. Um, but for me... I find it a Ouija board is basically an old fashioned tool of the modern day spirit box or K2. Mm -hmm. Cause what I, cause when people are like, Oh no, Ouija boards don't touch that. Hold on. Let me get my spirit box. Mm -hmm. I'll say to them, I'll be like, well, what's the difference? Yeah. And then that's where they kind of just go, Oh, I'm like, you're communicating or trying to communicate with the afterlife. So yeah, when I was doing research on it, I actually found that it actually went back to like the Egyptian times. They had something called a Senate board, which was, a Very game similar. board at the time, but it was kind of focused on, uh, you know, moving the spirit onto the afterlife. It was a game, but it means they kind of say that, you know, it was that maybe originated, uh, we just kind of led to the, you know, invention of the Ouija board. And that was sort of something similar back in the day. So I think that's been around for a really, really long time as a tool to kind of bridge, you know, communication between the dead and the living. And that was a huge focus in Egyptian times, of course. So, I don't know if that's true, but I mean, yeah, I totally agree that it could be something that is like a old fashioned spirit box. Cause why not? Another thing I've heard about the Ouija board is um, it was used as a, a tool to get couples together that, you know, back in the days when heaven yes. forbid, put your hand on a lady's leg, vice versa. It was meant for people to be closer together and do that together as well. Yes. Cause you're supposedly your knees would be touching and that was supposed to be like an erotic type, you know, interaction back in Victorian days. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so oh. that was our experience with the Ouija. So I still have it. I didn't get rid of it. So who knows? Maybe someday we will, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe you'll have a little revival. I don't know, but that was I, I, I used, I was investigating um, the pink palace in Surrey last week or the week before. Ooh. And, um, the 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 staff there they were we were i was watching them use it and um uh, here's a good ghost story for you um so we were on the third floor of the pink palace and they were doing the old ouija board and they're like you're moving it no you're moving it so they're doing the whole that but they were getting answers and then all of a sudden in the room by the we where the ouija board was being used on the so we were in the hallway but the room you could hear people talking like a woman talking Oh, that's creepy. And the hotel's abandoned. Wow. And um, we couldn't unlock the door. Like, the, we were with Ooh. the manager. She couldn't unlock the door. And it was just really freaky. Oh, that would be. Yeah. Cool. See, that would be scary, not being able to unlock a door. I'm glad we haven't experienced that. <laughs> and, you know, that was the one time that we used the Ouija at the English Inn. But I've been, at, I've been to the English Inn before. Yeah where I had a kind of a creepy experience. So it was just me and my husband this time. We were staying there. And this was like back when we weren't really investigating, you know, ghosts or anything. But we were sleeping. And in the middle of the night, um, the door opens to our room. And a woman comes in. She's in her nightgown. And she says, oh, I think I've got the wrong room. And, you know, I kind of have a few words and everything. And then she strolls back out. I close the door. And at this time, I lock the deadbolt because I'm like, okay, does somebody have a key or, you know. But I wasn't going to worry about it. And I thought the next day I'm just going to go downstairs and talk to the staff. And um, I did talk to the lady at the front desk. And I said, you know, I think maybe there's just a, a mix-up because somebody walked into our room last night. And, you know, she said, yeah, but there there is no other key. And 
And I said, I thought, well, maybe I didn't lock the door from the inside. And she said, well, yeah, but remember in the, in the rooms, you know, once the door closes, like the, the door is locked from the outside. So she didn't look like a ghost. Um, and there was nobody else on the floor, which was the weirdest thing. Cause they said the next day they had the place kind of empty because there was a, a wedding party coming. So we were only there for like a day before we moved on to go to a different hotel. But I thought that was really weird. So the English Inn for me, I actually really loved. So I'm hoping in the renovations, they're not going to be too harsh on the actual building because it is a beautiful building. And um, I think a lot of, a lot of energy kind of sticks around there. So I think, uh, and and ghosts don't like renovations. I don't think. No, um, that's one thing I've been told by clients and curators of places we've gone is um, the more you mess around with the locations they're used to, the mm-hmm. more it disrupts their everyday, I would say, life, but yeah. their everyday routine. Yeah, and another reason we were really glad um, from the historical side that we did go there the few times that we did go there because we did, were able to at least get really good photos of the thatched house. And even when you go to our website, that's one of the first um, on our homepage, that's the first picture there is the thatched house and no longer exists. Um, and it no longer exists. So we are really, really happy when those types of things where we can – be there you know and that's one of the motivations again for doing this stuff is that you know here we got something that um is no longer there the outbuildings are no longer there when we were there they were quite overgrown and creepy looking but we still got a lot of really you know beautiful photos and you know we're happy that we can pass those along and you know now they're preserved forever and we can you know have them out there for the public to see so all right I guess I'll jump in here because I finally get to talk. You two okay. have been doing absolutely amazing along with Merle. All right. You know, when, when it comes to to the paranormal ghosts and and everything that people are looking for, Gina, Victoria, I'm curious as we've got about just over six minutes here to go before we go to break at the top of the hour. What do you think ghosts are? I think it's just uh, it is leftover energy. I mean, that's the most... Uh, common explanation and i really do kind of believe that that it's you know once you pass on um there's an energy that gets left behind Mm -hmm. and in some cases it gets left behind to the point where you know it can actually sort of manifest for whatever reason whether it's unrest or you know certain a certain person who died there maybe loved the place and they still want to stay so you know that could be the case yeah um in the situation of cemeteries, a lot of people talk about cemeteries and say, oh, you know, it's not really a place where hauntings happen because the people didn't die there. And I do tend to agree with that, that, you know, they, they didn't die there. But I think when a lot of rituals happen in a location, like there's a lot of different denominations that gather for, you know, burying their dead. Grieving. There's a lot of grieving. There's a lot of intense emotion. And there's, you know, and that goes on over and over and over again at some locations. So, I kind of think that those places just attract other energies. So that might not be necessarily a person who died at the graveyard or, you know, or that's buried there, but something's attracting energy to this place because of the energy we give off. And I think sometimes the energy we give off can help something come, you know, come to life, so to speak. And that's why we always look into the to the history as well. Yes. But also there. we look at the foundation of the geography of the place mm-hmm. as well, too. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so. Yeah, and certainly places, you know, they say that places with water and different mm-hmm. types of things kind of attract energies, right? So I, I just think there's a lot of, uh, sometimes a lot of uh, intense energy that's left over. And there's different kinds, of course. People have heard of, like, the residual hauntings where things are just kind of replaying over and over again, which I tend to believe that there's, you know, the stone tape theory and all of that, that certain places kind of uh, give off, like, you know, they're like a tape recording. And then people have seen things like the whole, they've seen, like, whole Civil War, you know, battles happen, just like snippets yeah. of them. And so to me, that's really, really fascinating so that, that that's left behind. And then with the more intelligent hauntings, I think, it is people that are still left that are trying to communicate with the living for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, whether, and whether we're, you know, and we think that a lot of times that um, those things just sort of manifest and we, they just happen for the moment. You know, I think that those energies are around us all the time, but we're not always in tune with them and we're not always in the headspace to be in tune with them. So, you know, sometimes I think they're 
around and we just don't notice. So I think you have to kind of open yourself up to the possibility of that happening. And there are people who experience things like hauntings that never thought about seeing a ghost or never wanted to see a ghost, but it happens for whatever reason. And I just think with that, it's your just happening to be at the right place at the right time. <laughs> That's what's interesting. See, one of the things that I'm battling right now with ghosts, are they just acting on a different timeline and we're the ghosts to them? Ah, uh, you know, dimension. you know, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is looked at as well. You know, like the parallel, parallel worlds going on at the mm -hmm. same time. And, and that's you where know, we talked about people. earlier. Yeah. And earlier we talked a little bit about during one of the breaks and the, for the YouTube folks out there, we talked about the whole doppelganger thing, you know, but so doppelgangers, a lot of times people say that, you know, you, you see your, your doppelganger, but you're sort of on a different timeline and you're seeing yourself, but it's in a different timeline, which is completely freaky to me to kind of think of that. But uh, so that is a possibility. I kind of think that it could be possible. Merle, what's your thoughts? I think um, it is a possibility, but I do think like when we're just talking about residual hauntings earlier, I, I think they, some of them don't realize they're passed away. And I think some do. Mm -hmm. Like the hotel we were investigating this past weekend, the curator there says she'll go in there some nights and she'll hear people partying, having fun, like old time partying and having fun. And it's the same, same time, usually the same day of the week. Like one of the things there every Friday or every Monday night at 8 p.m. they have uh, in the 1800s, early 1900s, they had like a movie night, you know, the old fashioned movie projector. And um, one of the tells of this place is the residual haunting of people going up and down the hallway, seeing a lady in, in a white dress going up and down the hallway, walking. Because the theater room is still set up how it was back in the day when we walked in there. We're like, we're like oh, my God, time time warp. And um, when we were rolling audio and investigating, we played some old time music because there was the same um, music stand with the old original there. It had, um, like, music on it, too, like that you'd read or play a guitar with or whatever. And um, we matched that song on YouTube, and we played that song really low. And we heard, foot no word of a lie, we heard footsteps in um, in the hallway coming towards the, where the theater was. So I do think that the residual hauntings are a thing. But I don't think, we like what Dave said, we're the dead ones. No, we just might feel like it sometimes, you know. Yes. <laughs> well, you know what? We've got about a minute to go here. The reason why I bring that up is we had a situation here on an investigation I was on where we met up with a Chinese couple going to Barkerville, B.C. Mm. And maybe it was just coincidence, but... They wouldn't move their cart or what we assume was their horse and buggy because everyone traveled by them until all of us left the path. That's mm. what weirds me out. That's what makes me question absolutely everything right now. Interesting. Yeah. So it's something to think about. We're going to continue on here on Spaced Out Radio. And we have another hour left on the show. So Ghost of the Great White North with Merle from Paranormal Road Trippers will continue right after this, along with our special guests from HauntedHistoryBC.com. We have the sister team of Gina and Victoria. We're having a great night, great stories tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I hope you are enjoying them as much as I do. At the bottom of the hour, we are going to get into the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Dave, a jam-packed hour three of Spaced Out Radio coming up next. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. 
t-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumble Fuck? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumble f- Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. 
We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hello, everyone. This is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate you taking the time. Hi to everyone on our terrestrial affiliates across the continent and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Always remember, you can check out our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Parabolanus. Parabolanus is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. On Twitter, follow us at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce Ghosts of the Great White North. We got Merle from Paranormal Road Trippers here, and our special guest guest tonight the sister team of gina and victoria they are with hauntedhistorybc.com if you want to check them on out ladies merle welcome back hello there hello hello awesome. Thank you, Dave. now merle you're going to kick things off here yes so i always like to ask teams this give us one of your most i don't want to say scary encounters where you guys thought it was a bit too much um, well, I would, investigations. I would mm-hmm. say mm-hmm. definitely the um, the Pendre Inn, mm-hmm. yeah, because that was so intense and so many different things happened. And it and even some of the things that I mentioned, we we even left out stuff like, you know, as on that same night where we had the like the cork flying and the disembodied voice and all of that. At one point, we were actually coming up the stairs, where towards the end of the night, as we were partying on the landing to go our separate ways to two different rooms. We sort of heard a woman's voice, like, say, like, good night or something. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. I know. And then Bill, your husband, he just you know, uh, responded back thinking that it was that it one was, of us. That it was one of us saying something. I said, I didn't say anything. And yeah. none of us said anything. Nobody did. And mm-hmm. then you had the mystery. Uh, well, that was the next morning. Yes. I was getting ready for breakfast. And we were decided that we're going to actually probably meet at a particular time. I think it was around 10 or something. Mm-hmm. And I was just getting ready. I was still in my room, but it wasn't even 10 o'clock. And I hear somebody knocking on the door. And I thought to myself, well, wow, that's kind of crazy. Cause I thought we've, we set a time and it was like almost an hour and a half before our time. And I hear someone knocking on the door. And so I just went over there thinking it was Gina. And so I, decide okay I'm going to open the door and sure enough nobody was around so I started looking around in the hallway I mean the hallway was fairly open space Mm -hmm. so it wasn't like a like a like a hallway where somebody could be just around the corner I mean the rooms were all spaced out you could see them it was out in the open yes more like a landing so like nobody could like duck behind anything or yeah so we kind of continued to have very strange occurrences that night and we you know we weren't expecting it at all because we just done, got done with the walk that night. So that that was a little bit freaky. So that one that one was freaky because there was just so much stuff happened. We kept thinking like, 
somebody's got to be playing a trick. So I know we kept saying that. no way, no way no. that we didn't hear this. We didn't see this, but we couldn't, yet. we couldn't really, we couldn't really debunk. So we were exactly. just like, okay, well it happened. Uh, we're just going to take it as, you know, the experience that was there. But, um, I would say it didn't really freak us out as so much as your like adrenaline is really running high when you're doing stuff like that. And when you experience it, so you're just kind of hyped up and, you know, but it was definitely kind of intense. And the great part too was also when the next morning I wanted to talk to some of the staff over there. Mm -hmm. I was trying to hold back and I tried to make sure that I didn't go a little bit overboard so they didn't think I'm kind of like some kooky mm -hmm. person there. So anyway, so I just wanted to ask sort of in a sort of a subtle way, like if other guests have had any type of experiences, if they shared anything with anybody there who was working there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember the lady at the in the lobby she just just said to me because I asked her too, like, well, you know, we've noticed on your website you have a little bit of like a paranormal story behind the Pandre Inn, and and she just kind of grinned and and she goes, yeah, it's just there for you know tourist sake, and I'm like, okay, but uh, has anybody told you that maybe they've heard voices or she just kind of looked at me a little bit, but she was also quite intrigued and she says, what kind of voices? <laughs> So, and I had mentioned to her about the voice that we heard in that dining room. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, um, we, we didn't hear about that. And, but she looked quite serious. She looked quite serious and she was a little bit, she almost looked like she was a little bit freaked out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was the best, I would say, experience probably. That was the creepiest because yeah, it just kept on going. That was the creepiest. Um, I do have another one about where I live currently. So... Yes. That's why I started talking to the neighbors. I didn't do it right away. We only moved in here last year in March. And then um, for, even from the very first night that we came in here. So the first night we spent in here, in the middle of the night, huge crash. And of course, I'm thinking, I've got a couple cats. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, something got knocked over. A cabinet fell over. You know, when you move stuff, you just kind of cram it into the corner. Um, didn't hear any, uh, didn't see anything. So looked around, nothing to be seen. Ever since then, we still hear stuff in the hallway. We still hear stuff in the kitchen. And one particular night, um, I just got done like a couple weeks before doing a kitchen renovation. And it was kind of like a half kitchen renovation. We kind of painted the cabinets. We didn't take anything out, but we sanded everything down, made it look all nice. And so I'm sitting there. It's about 11 o'clock one night. I'm looking at the cabinets, kind of admiring our little handiwork there. I kind of noticed a little section where it looks kind of like a little bit orange or something on there. So I thought, oh, geez, is it peeling already? Because that was oak cabinets behind there. <laughs> so I kind of took a closer look. and I'm like, oh, it's food. Like there's food spatters. I'm like, what the hell? I'm grabbing my sponge or whatever to wipe it off. And I'm thinking, okay, well, it's kind of behind the hinge there. So I open up the cupboard. And just shortly before that, we heard this huge bang that looked like that sounded like an explosion going off. In our kitchen, we rushed in there, couldn't see anything. But when I opened the drawer, it was a jar of soup where the lid blew straight off. <laughs> and there was soup everywhere in this counter, in this cupboard. So I thought, oh, my God, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night. I just want to go to sleep. But now I'm stuck cleaning this thing. So we took out all the cans and everything. I'm wiping everything down. And then where the cabinets kind of connect to the wall, there's like a little space. So I kind of managed to clean everything up, but I see there's like spatter of soup. So I kind of take a little butter knife with a, with a little piece of paper towel and I'm kind of scrubbing back there, you know, total OCD kick kind of kicks in. I got to get like every single piece out of there, but I pulled the butter knife out and I am not kidding you. There was money back there. So old bills and I'm talking like 1950s. It wasn't like you're going to be rich type of money. But we probably all together found like a little over a hundred bucks. So to me, I thought, oh my God, we kept joking. Oh my God, the ghost wanted us to find this money behind the counter or behind the cupboard. And so we kind of dug out what we could. And you know, now we've already done our reno. So whatever's back there, I don't know if anything more is back there. But the next day my husband went back in with like kind of with a coat hanger. I was at work in the day. <laughs> and he texts me pictures. So he still found another twenty and another ten dollar bill. But these are like really, really old bills. Collectors uh, uh, money. Collectors and so ever money. since then, and so we found out that there was a guy named Jack who lived in this comp in this unit before and he died in here. So I kind of just I call my ghost Jack. So I kind of say, Hey Jack, so when I hear like rummaging in the kitchen or we hear him on a regular basis. We've heard like a, a voice out of nowhere. Like sometimes we think like, oh, did somebody say something? And it's just the two of us in here. 
And uh, I can't explain that. So it wasn't an intentional investigation, but it was an occurrence that was just Amazing. so mind blowing. And if it was a coincidence, it was like the biggest coincidence in my entire life. So that is my other really creepy story about actually where I live right now. So I'm convinced this building has some some energy left over. How about attachments? Have you guys ever experienced any sort of attachments from your investigations? Um, not no. from investigations, but I do have a ghost cat that follows me. So the ghost cat um, followed me from my old place um, where I lived and I moved last year. We always felt like we feel a cat brushing up against us. We've heard a cat meowing. I've got two, but when, every time I look at them, when I hear this, they're like dead asleep. Um, we've felt a cat jump on the bed. We look up to expect to see one of our cats and there's nothing. So that's the only one, but nothing, no, nothing sinister. So we've never experienced anything like attaching itself and that you brought anything home so far. I think Gina, you just sense, I think a little bit more than I do. Cause even when we went on some of the trips too, mm -hmm. you've actually were drawn to certain areas too. So, oh yeah. yeah sometimes. Have, so I yeah. kind of have a little bit of a, you know, just that little bit of a feeling when there's something or I've kind of get some names sometimes exactly. or an image of a person or something like that. But no, never brought them home so far. Mm -hmm. I hope not. No, you're lucky. You're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, you know, there's a lot of room. I, I heard um, uh, Annabelle escaped, right? So we're kind of making up the guest room for her in case she shows up. <laughs> Well, I don't think you want any of that. I mean, I she'll pick, up, Ma no, no, no. She'll pick yeah. up Mandy, and the next thing you know, you're, you, yeah, you know. got the haunted dolls, and Robert the doll will come up from Florida oh, and don't God. take his photo without his yeah. permission. The haunted dolls oh, yeah. freak me out. So that that, that yeah. one we'll kind of leave alone for Those now. We'll creepy. go look at them from afar. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree. I agree. All right. As we continue on with Ghosts of the Great White North, Merle is here from uh, Paranormal Road Trippers and from Haunted... Uh, all of a sudden, hauntedhistorybc.com. We have Gina and Victoria as well as we are continuing on here on the show here. And I want to get into a topic here that is uh, really close to actually where I used to live. And it's the Maple Ridge and Wanock cemeteries. Because being an old mission boy myself, Mission British Columbia, where I had a lot of strange occurrences. That corridor between Maple Ridge and Mission, there's a lot of weird things that happen along there. And from the history that I have been able to learn, that was an area where there was a lot of battles between the settlers and the First Nations, as well as between different First Nation tribes. I mean, it was a violent area back then. Oh, yeah. And recently, we just actually this weekend, um, we went to uh, Maple, Maple Ridge Cemetery and, and the Wanak Cemetery. And yeah, and there was the settlers. There was, um, uh, I'll let you talk about this one. Yeah, well, the Wanak Cemetery is actually was also referred to as the Lee Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing some research on it, too, as well, we actually know a few people who still live there. And they're actually descendants from the actual uh, um, the pioneers over there. But it was interesting because it, like when we were first trying to find the location, it's just off the beaten path. And um, it's just very peaceful, but it's a very tucked away area and it's on a dead end street. And it is a private area. Um, it's no longer in use. That's what we discovered. Um, but the people who have been buried there, um, they've got sure a lot of rich history. Like there's a lot of interesting things. Um, it, it's well worth the visit. I would actually recommend if anybody is local that just to, you know, just yeah, be a it, tourist in your own backyard. It, check it out. It's very interesting. Um, the Actually, the Wanock itself, it adapted, I mean, it, pardon me, it adopted um, the name from a local First Nation people. And, and it actually refers to place of the humpback salmon. Mm -hmm. um, and the very worst, the, actually... What, what I found what was really interesting about the cemetery itself, um, there's, like, you would probably miss it. Like, the graveyard mm -hmm. over there, some of it, some of the markers are actually uh, visible and others aren't. Mm -hmm. Some have markings, some don't. You don't, you can't even tell some of the people have been buried there. But it was very interesting that um, by the 1880s, when the railway was actually established, the homesteads began filling up over there and, and, the, and the settlers who came in 
they were primary from Great Britain and Norway. And I didn't, like, we never even knew that the Norwegians were actually part of the primary uh, pioneers over there. That no, was interesting. Yeah. No, we didn't. And both cemeteries, um, Maple Ridge and Wanock, have, uh, both have a Japanese section. That's the other one. So that's too. the other really yeah. interesting thing that they both have. Um, you know that as that was a big part of Maple Ridge and mm-hmm. Pitt Meadows history was you know the Japanese settlers that came and worked here and uh, you know started things up. So as pioneers, you know they opened shops and they had farms and yeah. and the Norwegian settlers at least they were the ones who set up the cemetery a portion of it Mm -hmm. and i I don't know it was just a very interesting very creepy feeling we went in there it is peaceful there's Mm -hmm. a lot of mature trees there it's very beautiful but in some ways it's very eerie Mm -hmm. and um i have to say that um as gina pointed out that um, when the japanese settlers moved in um it was very interesting because they also were quite um into berry farming and they were very successful at doing that but um, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, unfortunately, the Canadian government, they evicted them. Mm-hmm. And um, as Merle mentioned, too, the internment camps, um, mm-hmm. they were sent there to the interior. Yeah. It was just interesting. I, You know, we lived here for so many years, and I've never had, actually, I didn't even know the background to the story, to the cemetery. So yeah. it was interesting. And we, and we did try to do some EVPs. I know that's not a common, you know, belief that you'll catch anything at a cemetery. We've, we've had a couple, you know, groups tell us that they have caught things. So, oh, we didn't get anything, but, um, you know, we, we got used also a digital recorder. And yeah. So we didn't get out. anything as far as that goes, but yes, definitely some, some good history around this area. Um, down here also, there's a, there's an old church down here in Maple Ridge, like right by the Maple Ridge museum. And that one is uh, kind of an old one. And what people have experienced there is, you know, it's a church that's still in use. But people say that after hours they've heard voices and, like, groups of people. It almost seems like there's parishioners at the church, like, really, really late at night. So mm. that's been kind of a really eerie story. Mm-hmm. The Maple Ridge Museum itself has no hauntings. I mean, that one, paranormal groups have come in. Uh, they've done the Haney House and Maple Ridge Museum, and there has been there has been no activity there. So, but the Pitt Meadows Museum had something. Yeah, that one, and that one we're working on with uh, with somebody oh, there to the kind curator. of compile some stuff because mm-hmm. we're gonna hopefully go in there, and uh, they were very very open to uh, gathering some some good material mm-hmm. for us. We haven't seen it yet, but we're very excited. But they had a paranormal investigator group over there as well about a few they years do. back. And mm-hmm. apparently they captured something and they've documented that information. So when uh, anybody who does visit the museum, you can actually read up on the whole report. It's, mm-hmm. it's quite fascinating. They've apparently captured some some lights too as well. Like in oh yeah, because the they do the ghostly tours. They do, yeah. They, they do the they ghostly try, tours yeah. again. So that's always, you know, kind of a fun thing to do too. So right around Halloween. Usually. Yeah. Yeah. So that was always interesting. Yeah. And just a little ways away too. I mean, you know, and kind of drifting a little further out, um, there's always, you know, there's Fort Langley too. And we sort of mentioned that one on our website because we were half lucky enough to do the Grave Tales tour, which was a really good ghost walk. Um, you know, you hear a lot of uh, stories of the fur traders, First Nations, you know, a lot of people came here for the gold rush. So that was you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened. There's a lot of competition. And Hawaiian influence as yeah, well. Yeah, Hawaiian influence. So there was a, a Hawaiian settlers in Fort Langley that we didn't know about. Yeah. And so, you know, we went through there. And then um, there's it, there's been a lot of report of unrest and paranormal activity in, in parts of town. And, you know, in the earliest parts, um, the Katsi and Kwantlen and Matsuki First Nations were there. And then Fort Langley eventually, you know, became a huge export for lumber to the Hawaiian Islands. So one of the... Um, Hawaiian folks that are seen as an apparition is um, a fellow called Peo Peo. And he actually, for St. George's Church that's still there in Fort Langley, um, he built the metal cross that's on top of the church. And people supposedly see him around the grounds. And though we had nothing ghostly happen on the ghost walk, and we didn't expect it to, I mean, we just were going there for the history and for the walkthrough, but I did take a bunch of pictures because we always take a ton of pictures. And one of the eeriest pictures I got was near the cemetery and the church. And if you look towards kind of the back of my photo, and I want somebody else to analyze this. So I want to go to Fort Langley and just say, can somebody please look at this? But 
it looks like image. an image like that you can see through an apparition. It almost has like that native Hawaiian, like a headdress. And it kind of, mm -hmm. it kind of looks like that. Cause at first when I was looking through my photos, I saw, well, who was there? Cause we were in a bigger group. We had probably about 20 people with us in this group. And I thought somebody must've wandered away and got into the picture. And as I start kind of zooming in on it with my iPhone, I thought, definitely wasn't somebody it wasn't some no, no you can see through it but it's mm -hmm. in the image of an actual like a human figure yeah. so that one was kind of interesting I'm, I'm not going to say that that's it for sure because photos can be kind of twitchy especially at night because we mm -hmm. went at night but um the storyteller was amazing so we really loved all the stories about the apparitions and wandering through the graveyard and everything people have seen a first nations ghost that's been repeatedly seen and people describe him in the very in the similar way so multiple people have seen him and described him to like real similar accuracy so you know something's there um people have seen like a ghostly boy you know who kind of plays in one of the playgrounds that it that's beside the church so they say that you know they've seen children mm -hmm. people have seen a blacksmith doing his work in one of the buildings um, cold spots have been felt so there's definitely something. And then there's a spirit with a lantern who walks around the grounds. That would be kind of creepy. So a lot of interesting um, history mm -hmm. locally. Mm -hmm. We only got about two and a half minutes left with all of you tonight. And it's a show that has flown on by. And I say thank you so much for that. Merle, what's your projects coming up here in the next little bit? And holy crap, do I have a big daddy long leg spider in my yeah. studio that I'm staring at right now. And this is, yeah. Yep, we're going to have to get him out. Merle? My projects right now are to go through six or seven investigations of evidence. So I have a bunch of audio and video to go through. And I'll probably post all that stuff on YouTube when we're done it so so we can share our evidence and history on that. And um, I've, got, I've got multiple investigations at a hotel in Surrey coming up. Surrey, mm -hmm. British Columbia. And um, I got some stuff coming up in Vernon. So busy, busy. And how about for you ladies? Uh, we have a few things. So we did yeah. mention our um, calendar with the Greg Mansfield. So we're going to do um, Haunted Vancouver Ghosts. So that will be coming out in October of this year. So it is just weeks away, literally. Yeah. And then um, we're working on a couple of book okay. projects. Yeah. So we have a book in the works uh, called Evenings and Avenues, Hauntings and the Outskirts. So the, all the things we talked about. Yeah. Uh, Vancouver proper has been uh, the territory of some people. So we kind of don't want to encroach upon that. And it's been written about. So And there's people who continue to investigate. So we kind of want to respect that. But there's a lot of you know, haunt, hauntings out there that haven't been covered. We talked about that earlier in the show. So we're hoping to kind of dis you know, discover a few more of those. So... And, of course, just going weekly to locations where we can explore. You know, we want to have a few more cemeteries on the on the plate and so on. So yeah, check out sites that probably are not necessarily yeah. uh, popular. And we're going to kick yeah. out our contest. So Absolutely. So starting, I think, tomorrow or the next day, since we want to wait, wait to the radio show, but we're going to uh, kick off a contest on Twitter, and we will have a link on our website called Otherworldly Ghosts. So we want your ghost stories from around the world. We'll be picking 15 winners to win prizes for, like, the best ones that we enjoy. Um, we'll be giving them free calendars, either free postcards or whatever to the winners. But everybody will be featured on our site at one point if they're okay with us sharing. So that'll be something that we will yeah. kick, kick off here in the next, literally the next day or two. Yeah. So just pay attention to our Twitter. Go on our website, and uh, we'll, we'll be there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Merle, for coming back on. Goes to the right, Great White North. We'll talk to you next month, my friend. Sounds good. And Gina and Victoria from Haunted History BC.com. I just wanted the dramatics there. Haunted History BC.com. You guys were fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight. Coming up next. We have the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. More Spaced Out Radio coming up after this. Hello. 
Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. We all know on Spaced Out Radio, we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. If you like it hot, real hot then heat up your meals with bumblefoot hot sauce get your bumblefoot hot sauce today the sauce bumblelicious and the four million scoville unit bumble we're going in hot real hot coming out even hotter keep the milk nearby and tantalize your taste buds tonight bumblefoot hot sauce available now at kajans.com Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. 
Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. Sitting here in the studio, spider-free now. Got rid of the daddy long legs. Put it outside. No, I do not kill spiders. I do not kill spiders. They eat a lot of bugs. You can't kill them. You just got to put them outside. So that's what I did. Anyways, want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do me the favor hit that subscribe button our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to bumblefoot and reading up on captain shirks sor newswire on twitter you can follow us at spaced out radio and on instagram at spaced out radio show speaking of the news here we go let's do this thing The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky. Yeah. And sometimes we travel around the world. Stunned locals have spotted a series of unidentified flying objects over the sky of Sydney. The spectators reported seeing the strange lights during the early hours of Wednesday morning. The residents said they weren't sure what they were seeing, but some speculated it might have been satellites or even a UFO. But the sighting was later put down to Elon Musk's recent Starlink satellite constellation launched by SpaceX. Funny, I didn't think you could see them in the daylight. It was the aerospace company's 100th successful launch, and it's 11th as part of the Starlink mission to create a global high-speed internet service. Yes, apparently it looked like a slow-moving line of satellites or something. It was very odd, said one person. Another said the strange lights looked like they were with the width of the moon. Another person said they thought they were looking at the space station. I thought it was a space station, at least. I thought the sun was hitting on it, but then it was moving a lot slower than the space station usually does. Meanwhile, others joked it was aliens, because you know what? You can never have enough aliens. Oops, I got in trouble for that earlier. But after seeing the state of the earth in 2020 they decided to go home lights could also be seen in england where keith mayo managed to get footage just before posting it on twitter the lights could also be seen from his garden about a little bit ago and he said i saw an object floating across the sky west to east too slow for a plane no sound sun glimmering off of it oh yeah everybody's got aliens now everybody could be a weather balloon don't forget roswell was a weather balloon Allegedly. A toy hand from a Lego set has come out of a boy's nose two years after he got stuck in his nostril. Samir Anwar from Dunedin on New Zealand's South Island was playing with the Lego piece in 2018 when he decided to shove it up his nose. What kid doesn't do that? His dad, Mudasir, shot a torch up Samir's nose at the time, but could not see it. The GP that they went to told the family that it would quickly find its way out through a natural body causes, but it didn't. Since then, they were pretty confident that he didn't have anything in his nose. However, little Samir wasn't so certain that the hand from his Lego set had made its way to the other side. His dad said he was complaining in the days after. He said, no, there's something in my nose. But two years on, the family had assumed it had passed through. But thankfully, this week, little Samir, I don't know if he was having a pick or what. Well, anyways, he was out with his family having a muffin with some fairy dust on top that agitated his nose. According to the father, he started getting anxious again, and we said to him, just go and blow your nose. So he did. 
Okay, so it wasn't a pick. It was a blow. Anyways, to the surprise of the family and little Samir, the black Lego hand came out into the tissue, leaving him really surprised. We were all shocked. His eyes wide open. He's like, I found the Lego. I kept telling you it was in there, but you said that it was not. Or was it snot? I don't know. To- today, Samir has been told or been to the doctor once more and been told for the second time, and hopefully the last, that his nostrils are all clear. I was surprised and a bit scared, Samir said, adding that he still has a, is a massive Lego fan and that he's impressed that the piece had stayed intact. Oh, good old Samir. I like that story. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I like that story. Okay. Japan is largely tolerant of salarymen snoozing on trains after an evening out, but authorities now are getting a little worried because there's a new alcohol trend. More than 7,000 cases of Rojoni literally sleeping on the road last year. So apparently what happens is you go out with the boys or the girls, you go get absolutely wasted to the point where you're going to pass out, and instead of getting your buddies to drive you home, no, you just find a piece of road and go to sleep right there. So police in Japan's southernmost prefecture, located 1,000 miles from Tokyo, are thought to be the only force in the country that keeps statistics on Rojoni. I didn't even know what the term was before coming to Okinawa. I think it's a phenomenon unique to this island, one person said, who took uh, became prefectural police chief less than a year ago. In most instances, people are roused for their impromptu slumber before coming to any harm. But 16 of those cases last year resulted in accidents, three of them fatal. Who the hell just falls asleep in the middle of the road? Anyways, restrictions on Japan's nighttime economy prompted by the coronavirus has failed to slow the trend. In the six months of this year, police have received 2,702 Rojoni emergency calls, about the same number as at the same point last year. I mean, you can't make this up. It's going on. Locals believe Okinawa's warm weather combined with, oh, you know, some fancy type of alcohol which is unique to the island, that gets you drunk really, really fast, are what's fueling this phenomena, a criminal offense that can result in up to a 50,000 yen fine, so about 400 bucks. Anyways, radio broadcasts and a photo exhibition warning of the dangers of Rojoni do not appear to have convinced drinkers to stop while they are still capable of making it safely into their own beds. Oh, no! Not at all. Don't get me wrong, one person said. Alcohol isn't bad. It's just bad to drink in excess. No kidding. No kidding. Let's move on. What's with Japan? Honestly, what are they doing over there? So now a pair of Tokyo parks are attracting extra attention. Why? Well, they built their public toilets with transparent walls. So now everybody's going to know whether you are a toilet paper hoard, if you wash your hands before or after, or if you sit or stand to pee. Yes, the restrooms designed by Shingeru Ban Architects feature the see-through walls that turn opaque when the user enters the facility. Oh, okay. So I I overreacted here. Uh, That's okay. That's okay. I overreacted. Okay. So the walls change color the minute you start doing your doo-doo. Yeah, what do you do with your doo-doo? Anyways, the restrooms installed in the park are designed to allow those in need of the facilities to go quickly determine their cleanliness and whether they are already occupied. Hold on. If you're using it, isn't it going to show? Anyways, there's two things we worry about when we enter a public restroom, especially those located in the parks. Tokyo's Toilet Projects website stated, the first is cleanliness, and the second is whether is anyone is inside. The walls change from transparent to frosted opaque when the door lock is activated. This allows users to check the cleanliness and whether anyone is using the toilet from the outside. At night, the facilities light up the park in a beautiful, like, lantern. Users said remembering to lock the doors is of extra importance since a user inside the facility can't tell whether the walls appear transparent or frosted from the outside. Each of the two facilities includes a men's toilet, a women's toilet, and a mixed-use toilet. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? 
So, anyways, back on this side of the pond, a police officer was in need of assistance after firefighters found that he accidentally was bound by his own handcuffs. Yeah, this happened in uh, over in Britain. The Northamptonshire Fire Police Rescue Service tweeted a crew used a pedal cutter to release a police officer who had his hands stuck in his own handcuffs. Yeah, Police Sergeant Scott Renwick, the region's core training sergeant, revealed that there's a little bit of embarrassment going on. Well, that wasn't a good start to the day, he said on Twitter, thanks to at Northant Fire for cutting me out of some broken cuffs. Hashtag not funny. I would have laughed too. Yes. Be careful of your own handcuffs. A man has been accused of faking his own kidnapping in Mississippi to extort money from his father who lives in Virginia. Nice kid. Real nice kid. Yeah, the investigation began when Andrew Blake Hawk's father told deputies he had received a video call that showed his son tied against a tree with a gun pointed to his head. Hawk's father told investigators the incident happened in Lee County and that alleged kidnappers had demanded money in exchange for his son's life. When they did not receive the money by the deadline the same day, deputies said the alleged kidnappers threatened to cut off Hawk's fingers and fired gunshots that led his father to believe Hawks was killed. Later that evening, the suspects were told the money had been transferred through Western Union. Police did not disclose how much money Hawks was trying to receive. However, when investigators arrived at the store where the money would be picked up, guess who was there? Oh yeah, you guessed it. It was the son. Who does that to their parents? Honestly, who does that to their parents? Sick. Absolutely sick. Anyways, deputies said his accomplice, David Fisher, was in the store shopping at the time. He was also arrested. The both have been charged with extortion. Moving on, shall we? Let's. All right. I don't agree with this. I really don't. I'll tell you why, if I can speak. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you win a lottery, like millions... I think there should be a timeline on when you can play again and win. So this couple in Nova Scotia, seven years ago, won $2.4 million in the Atlantic lottery. So what do they do? They keep playing because they like their lottery tickets. And lo and behold, they have hit the millions once again. This time, 13.2 million. Now, you know, I'm all for people, you know, buy your tickets. If that's what if that's what you like to do, go for it. However, Raymond Littlington of Dingwall said friends were making fun of him for continuing to play the lottery after winning the big bucks on the Lotto 649. In 2013, I still played, he said. You'll never win again, I said. Of course I will. But that was a joke. I never imagined that it could actually happen. Winning twice is what makes this so hard to believe. What are the odds? I could have never expected this, and it's so much money that it's hard to absorb that information. The couple said their first jackpot went towards a new home, new vehicles, traveling, and making their retirement comfortable. Then they said this latest prize will allow them to share generously with their children and grandchildren. Our kids are even more mesmerized than we are. We just can't believe it, Lillington says. My oldest texted me a million times today. He can't eat. He can't sleep. The kids just can't believe it's real. That's because it shouldn't be. All right. There are other people there. You won two and a half. You hit the lottery the first time. Pun intended. All right? There are people in this country who are begging for a miracle. Begging. And you kept going. 
and you want again. It's great that you're going to donate to your children and your grandchildren pay for college or, or whatever it may be. Either way, not a fan of it. Not a fan. A pair of identical twin sisters who married identical twin brothers have announced that they're both pregnant. Brittany and Brianna Solliers, who met their husbands Josh and Jeremy at the 2017 Twins Day Festival in Twinsburg, Ohio, and were married in a TLC special, have announced on their joint Instagram that they are all pregnant. Our children will not only be cousins, but full genetic siblings and quaternary multiples. Can't wait to meet them and for them to meet each other, the Post said. The couples lived together in the same home, and the sisters previously said that they had hoped to become pregnant at the same time and give birth on the same day. Okay. So an airplane attempted to land at a Russian airport, but was delayed for 20 minutes in the air. Why? There was a bear wandering around the runway. The S-7 Airlines flight out of Novosibirsk, was coming in for a landing at the airport in Megadon when the flight spotted a bear on the tarmac. The crew spotted the bear while about 500 feet, allowing for the flight to adjust and circle around the airport. The plane made a second landing attempt about 20 minutes later, and everything happened safely. The bear, by the way, was moved from the runway and back into the forest. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? <laughs> Thought of the Nave happens every night at this time where you ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's Thought of the Nave is as follows. Do, 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 do. Oh, come on. This is a lot of fun. I love this song. What bugs you about today's ghost hunters? That's our question. Peter. Most of them are opportunists looking to make a buck. Stop watching these ridiculous shows years ago. Nothing but fake. Cherry. It seems clickish. Juan. What doesn't? Jules. The gorgeous Jules. They are usually there for stirring things up in their own jollies, and that can be harmful. Quinoa, it really bothers me when they finally see, hear something, freak out, and run away. That's what you were looking for. Why are you running? Also, they don't ever help any spirits move on and assume any shadow person is evil. So basically, all the stereotypes irk me. Audra. Are you talking about TV ghost hunters? Don't watch. Always dumb. Should be for profit. People just curious and doing their own thing. Be smart. Be respectful. Be kind. And be careful. Dang it. Joseph. All the shows seem staged fake right now. They feel overacted and like things are added in, enhanced, or edited these days. Lindsay. Everything about Ghost Adventures. It was a good first few seasons, but Zach really needs to take acting lessons. Plus, he's a real beep. Oh, Lindsay, that's that's bad language. Bad, bad language. But we'll love you anyways for that. John, too much fame and glory seeking is involved these days. I would agree with that. HL, the ego. With little results, common hunters, facts needed, not your fancy hoodie brands. Corrents, different Corey. The Paranormal Files or Proving Demons are the only ones I watch now, and those are on YouTube. Don, they are not interesting enough to get me to watch them. I'm not talking paranormal TV here, man. <clears throat> What's with everybody wanting to talk TV? Uh, Debbie, all of TV Paranormal should bother many. I will not watch it. Davey, the use of infrared. It attracts beings at the end of the spectrum. Caden doesn't like the egos. Nicole, what bugs me about ghost hunting is whenever supposed ghost hunters run around being rude and combative towards spirits, trying to force a reaction or answer. Too much showmanship, not enough actual data collected. Ryan, you don't hunt ghosts because they're not wild animals and they can't be killed in a second time. Thanks, Ryan. Have a shave for the first time. Kelly, 
Not enough data collection and way too much chutzpah to try and make their show seem more interesting. Donna, that they're just as idiotic as yesterday's idiots. Oh, that's nice. Barry, simple that none of them have any formal education in the field of science, such as physics, medicine, engineering, psychology, and last but not least, parapsychology. If one does not know how the physical world they live in really works, how can they even speculate about the paranormal one? Well, that's a huge comment. The gorgeous Jessica, they insult the intelligence of the once living. Robert, their lack of knowledge, skills, and professional attitudes. Bobby, they can never show evidence because they refuse to use a professional taxidermist. <laughs> Park, they found their niche instead of collecting Japanese samurai swords or working at medieval fairs as extras, they found the paranormal. What truly lends them credence is the sheer amount of tribal tattoos they all seem to have, I guess. That's thanks to the internet. Anyone can be anything. You don't even have to fake it until you make it anymore. You're just an instant researcher. It's pretty funny to watch. Tom, they're not willing to put in the work. They think they're real investigators because they watch a few shows and then they go to a haunted location. Kira, most are focused on ego and looking the part, not in touch with the spiritual side of things. Richard, too many people want to focus on the woo-woo rather than the basics like good investigative skills. Serena, spirit taunting. WTF, there are people still inconsiderate and just wrong. And Karen Smurl from the Smurl family haunting. We'll end it with her. She says, the fact that the ones without shows get mad at the ones with shows because they forget that the ones on TV are put there for entertainment purposes. TV equals entertainment per the people making the money. The ones out there really, truly helping people are the ones, not the ones on TV. Have you ever seen one of them actually help a family or location? Nope. It's, yep, it's haunted, because here's the evidence we caught. Good luck and goodbye. Thank you to everybody participating in the thought of the day. Captain Shirk for the news. Merle, Gina, and Victoria for the show tonight on Ghosts of the Great White North. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody in our chat rooms tonight, especially YouTube and Spreaker. Thank you to everybody on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio for hanging on out and showing us your beautiful snark. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. The Wu train has docked for the night, but tomorrow we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, guess what? We have room for them, too. Good night. <laughs>